Thank you very much. What a joy and honor to be here in Minneapolis. Uh, actually, speaking here twice in less than 10 days. I was over at uh, Bethlehem uh, College and Seminary just uh, a week and a half ago and was honored to be there. Honored to be with you guys. Glad to be here at Rock Point. Uh, so thrilled that uh, Pastor Roy Fruits and his wife uh, would invite me and, 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 and set up this event. Uh, you, you, know, you know a pastor by his fruits. And... Um, <laughs> This has been good fruit, <laughs> so praise God. Um, uh, I'm thrilled. Uh, your church has, has taken a, at least four that I know of uh, uh, trips to Israel. I've spoken at several, uh, to, to several of the times that you guys have been over there. And, and again, I want to um, honor you guys for the 50th anniversary of this congregation that God has planted here to preach the gospel, to teach the word of God, to make disciples, train, equip and uh, advance the kingdom, not just here in Minneapolis, but throughout the state, throughout the country, and around the world. So what a joy and honor to be here, and I'm kind of shocked that uh, this is not an evening service, right? This is a, you came, you know it's not an evening service, right? Maybe, now, the fact that it's full is, you know, maybe you thought Joel Osteen was coming. I don't know what you thought exactly, but I appreciate, uh, I appreciate you turning out tonight, and for whatever reason, maybe your wife dragged you or your husband or... You weren't sure what was going to happen, but uh, I hope it's encouraging tonight. Uh, so one of the things, so let me just start out. I, you know, I'm a little embarrassed by the video, um, but I, you know, my team is very kind and they, you know, they want to give you a quick uh, introduction. But basically what they didn't say was that I'm a failed political consultant. <laughs> That's actually my professional pedigree. Every candidate I ever worked for lost. Well, you're laughing because that's not your resume, so you wouldn't laugh so hard if it, you're like, mm, that's going to not go over so well. Um, I, uh, I helped Steve Forbes lose two presidential campaigns and about $70 million of the five daughters' uh, inheritance money that they were hoping for. And so, you know, I once worked for uh, Israeli then-former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, that was 19 years ago. I was on his comeback campaign team. It took him nine more years to come back. So I don't want you to think too highly of me because uh, that's really... And I'm one of the few Jewish people that grew up here in America, though I live in Israel. Now, uh, one of the few Jewish people that was born and raised in America that did not get the financial gene, okay? <laughs> I'm not your stockbroker, your hedge fund manager, uh, or your CPA, I'm not your doctor, your lawyer, your chiropractor. I don't run a major motion picture studio. All the good Jewish jobs I didn't get, okay? So I make things up for a living. That's, that is really what I do, right? Um, I tell my, my journalist friends, look, if you want to write fake news, that's fine, but there's a job for it. Be a novelist. That's, you, know, you just have to own it, right? You have to be honest about it. But I, that's what I do. I, every day I write fake news, and uh, I just call them political thrillers. And tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, writing these political thrillers with the gospel woven into them has opened up very uh, interesting doors, doors to preach the gospel, doors to, uh, to start the Joshua Fund. What is that? Why did we start it? What, what's it about? We're, we're talking a little bit about it, but I, wanna, I want you to hear it as part of a story, uh, the, the story of being somebody who was failing at everything and didn't get all these other skill sets and God was locking every door in the corridor until I finally was willing to go through the door at the end marked make things up. <laughs> and that's not, you know, that's not the normal way to go into uh, life or ministry, but, uh, but that's been the way that God has done it for me. And so uh, I want to talk about that and why I would quit everything and just run the Joshua Fund if I could, but the Lord won't let me. I love this ministry, and, I, and you'll, I hope you'll hear my heart and our team's heart for why uh, we do what we do and what is it that we actually do. Um, we'll talk about that this evening, but, I, but, I, but the Lord is not letting me just do that. He, that, that was of, he wanted me to found it with my wife and, and, and recruit good people and do as much as we could to train, equip, and, and send them out to do the work that they are uniquely qualified to do. And I do serve as chairman, and, uh, and it's a great board. And, and several of the board members, as was mentioned, are uh, Rock Point members. So that's, uh, that's very, very fun, and it's very encouraging. But he wants me to be a novelist. The Lord wants me. This is what he wants me to, do it, to be doing. And for some reason, this is opening. It's like a key, these novels. is opening doors 
that I just never would have expected would have opened. Uh, and um, if I'd known, <laughs> you know, if the Lord had just said, hey, by the way, this is all going to work out. Just trust me. I mean, he does say that, actually. But I was not, you know, my, my wife is named Lynn, and she, she actually has the spiritual gift of discernment. That's very, that's very helpful in life. I have the spiritual gift of obliviousness. <laughs> and, and so I, I have to, well, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad to hear some men laughing too, because so there may be, I may not be the only guy in here uh, that, that has this. Those of you that are not laughing, your, your wife knows that you, 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 you're still trying to figure out, do I have that? I'm not sure. That's, that's the gift. And uh, it's probably noted most clearly on the road to Emmaus, that story at the end of Luke, where Jesus says, oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe. And uh, women, I know that most of you, that's your life verse. And... Uh, <laughs> Certainly, it's, it's my wife's life verse. Um, I'm only slightly kidding. But, um, so, uh, but, but it, it, God is interesting how he takes us down roads that we don't expect to serve in, in ways that we didn't expect. Even if we have a heart, we want to serve the Lord, but that doesn't mean we, that our plans have anything to do with his plans. In fact, that more often than not, he has very different plans because his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And we know that. We know it. But, but then we're like, oh, and you really meant that. <laughs> oh, I see. So let me just start to walk you through. But I'm going to start by uh, the passage of the Apostle Paul, right? The Apostle Paul, he had passion when he was Saul, when he was Rabbi Saul, when he was a Pharisee. He was sure he was doing the exact right thing. Right? He, he described himself as the most zealous Pharisee. He was the most legalistic guy. He was the top of, he, was, he wanted to be the, 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 he wanted to be a super Jew. He wanted to be the most uh, studied, learned, influential, and effective Jewish person in the entire Jewish religious world. That's what he wanted. He was totally wrong. He totally missed the Messiah until Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. And that famous passage, of course, is in Acts chapter 9. And while I'm not going to preach that tonight, you know that story, I do want to draw out uh, just a couple points as we set up this tonight. Because if there was ever a man, a Jewish man, trying to go one way and, and thinking that he was pleasing God, right? He wasn't doing it because he hated God. He, he was doing it because he believed this is the way to please the God of Israel. I know the law. I know it better than anybody. And I'm going to go change the world, at least the Jewish world, by being, uh, by being a, an effective leader in this world. And Jesus was like, no, no, that's not going to work. That is not going to work. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Right? And, and Saul says, who are you, Lord? Like, I, you know, who, what? He is not expecting to be rebuked by the God of Israel as he pursues being the the most effective Pharisee that there ever was. And of course, the Lord says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you will do. He's not having, Jesus is not having a discussion with Saul any longer. Saul should have known from the word of God that Jesus was, in fact, the fulfillment of all the prophecy. Saul knew the word of God, but he, was, he, was, he, he had a gift of obliviousness. Right? He could not get it that Jesus was filling everything that he was waiting for. And Jesus was not going to have a conversation with him any longer. He just tells him, I'm Jesus, you're following me, go to the city, and it'll be explained to you where, what you're going to do next. It's a pretty dramatic salvation. And uh, we know that Saul, for three days and three nights, is not eating, he's, he's not drinking, he's, he's, he can't see physically, but he's beginning to see finally. He's beginning to see spiritually, which was far more important than seeing physically. And then, of course, the Lord, we all know, uh, comes to one of his disciples in Damascus. Interesting that the Lord saves the greatest Jewish apostle in human history in an Arab city, <laughs> right, in Damascus. And, um, and so God comes to Ananias and says, Ananias, and Ananias says, here I am, Hineni, Adonai, here I am, Lord, what do you need? I'd like you to get up and I want you to go to the street called Straight and inquire at the home of the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in 
and lay his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. Now, we read this, we've, if we've been believers for any amount of time, but certainly if, if it's been a long time, we, we go, okay, that seems like a reasonable thing to do. The Lord tells you to get up, go, here's a specific address, go, go pray for this guy who's just come to Jesus. Unless it was Osama bin Laden, right? If he said, now I want you to get up, Joel, I want you to fly to Kabul, Afghanistan. I want you to go to the cave marked round. <laughs> and, and I want you to lay your hands and pray for this man from Saudi Arabia named Osama bin Laden. And, and he has been praying and he's heard that a guy named Joel is going to come and pray for him. And he's just come to Jesus and I want you to help him. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Uh, no. No. Then I would become a Jonah, right? And you'd want to get on a cruise ship and head to the Pacific. I'm not going to some cave. In, but, but and Ananias was like, um, excuse me, could, we get a, could I get a price check in aisle five? Um, what? Uh, now, he doesn't say no, but he needs some clarity. But, but this is an interesting response that the Lord gives, and that's really what I want to, want to underscore as we begin. Uh, in Acts chapter 9, verse 15, the Lord says to Ananias, Go. For he, Saul, that will become Paul, he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before three groups of people, Gentiles, kings, and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Doing the ministry of reaching Jewish and Gentile people, Jewish, Arabs, Muslims, in the Middle East uh, comes with a significant degree of, of, of spiritual warfare and resistance. Uh, we are, we are, the Jews and the Muslims are, are, are the most resistant groups to the gospel in the history of mankind. So if you're going to get involved in this ministry, it's going to come with uh, significant degrees of suffering. But this is God's heart. This is God's heart. And now, but so, so, so that's the setup, and I, I, that's, the, that's the biblical foundation for what we're going to talk about tonight. So let me tell you some stories about how I got where, out of uh, politics. So uh, the short version of that is simply, I, I had to go through political detox. After I helped uh, Netanyahu go nowhere, then that was, uh, and I'd helped Steve Forbes, and that was all in 2000. So by January 01, George W. Bush was, was becoming the president, and I had Help, I'd been the deputy campaign manager against him, so I wasn't getting hired, you know, by the, by the, the White House. And uh, m- more likely, I was hearing ringing in my ears Dana Carvey going, Nat Ganda, not gonna hire Joel, wouldn't be prudent, not this juncture, not gonna do it. I know that's more the father than the son, but still, not Ganda, very scary. Uh, so, I, uh, so, as it happened, I, I decided I got to get out of politics. I'm, I'm going to go through political detox. And I want to report tonight that after 18 years, I'm out. I'm clean. Though as we head to 2020, I need a patch. Okay, so I'm just, <laughs> just saying. Hashtag just saying. Um, so I, 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 I told my kids I was going to start to write a novel. I told my wife, and I'm going to write a political thriller. I'm going to get out of politics all that travel, all that chaos, all that. And I, I, I want to write a, a, a novel. I was trying to explain this to my three little boys. We've got a fourth now, but at the time, three little boys, uh, Caleb, Jacob, and Jonah. And then uh, seven years later, we had a Noah. And uh, so, but these, these were the boys we had. And, uh, and I said to them as we tucked them in one night, Daddy's going to get out of politics, and he's going to start writing. I'm going to start to write a story that's exciting with explosions and car chases and gun battles, you know, the stuff that, you know, like every gospel track should have that. And, and then I want to, and then as the book grabs you and pulls you in, hopefully I will start telling people about Jesus through one of the characters deep into the book when hopefully you can't put it down. That was the, that was the idea. And I said, now, the, Daddy has a few challenges. Daddy has never written a novel before. Um, Daddy does not like to read novels. And daddy does not have a story. So, so they're all looking at me like, <laughs> and uh, so I said, so what we're going to do is we're going to pray every night before bed, Jeremiah chapter 33, verse three. 
This is that wonderful passage, right? Uh, Call to me, says the Lord, and I will answer you, and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. I said, that is the perfect verse for daddy. Daddy does not know how to write novels. Daddy does not have a story. And dad does not even read fiction. So if this is not just some cockamamie idea that daddy has cooked up and daddy has warehouses out back filled with the crazy ideas that daddy has had over the years that have not borne out. But if this is from the Lord, he will guide us. So every night, this is what we're going to pray. And their only question was, will you be home more? And I was like, oh, yeah, I believe so, because this probably won't work, so yes. <laughs> but, you know, we can trust the Lord, but I'm a Russian Jewish pessimist at heart. I don't, I'm not proud of it, but my Russian Jewish side, which is my father's side, is uh, sort of dark, and, and uh, we, we think, not only are we not glass half full people, we're not even glass half empty people. We are glass, there's a crack in it, and it's leaking fast. That's... <laughs> If you're a Russian Jew, that's basically how you see the world. And I would say with good reason, but I'm just saying, you know, that's how we look at the world. And fortunately, my wife is a Gentile, and she loves Jesus. She's filled with the Spirit. So she helps balance me, and that's a, that's a very good thing. So anyway, long story short, I, I write this novel. Now, uh, I'm not going to go through that whole story. I've told it, and it's, it's, you can find it online, sort of how I got in you know, the whole process. But what happens is in November of 2002... Uh, the, the, my first novel called The Last Jihad is published. And no one's ever heard of me. I've been a behind-the-scenes political operative. Nobody knows who I am. Nobody cares. Um, and nobody knows this title of this book, The Last Jihad. But it releases in November 2002. And um, my publicist is, you know, it's the first book. They're, they're having a, he's having a hard time, or she, actually, she's having a hard time getting me placed on radio and television shows to sort of talk about the book because nobody knows who I am. But the book is, the, the book opens, the first sentence puts you in the cockpit of a jet plane that's been hijacked by radical Islamist terrorists. Um, oh, I just saw a picture up there, but it's not, okay, no. Uh, yeah, we're not using the pictures yet. Okay, sorry, they, they, they uh, distracted me. Focus. Uh, <laughs> not gonna, so, um, well, oh no, let's, all right, let's stay focused. So, uh, so the first page puts you inside the cockpit of a jet plane that's been hijacked by radical Islamist terrorists that's coming in on a kamikaze attack mission into an American city. Now remember, I began writing it in January of 01, almost nine months before the attacks of September 11th, 2001. And that story leads from the kamikaze attack on an American city, happens to be Denver, not New York or Washington, and it leads to my fictional American president declaring war on Saddam Hussein to remove him from power. That's the arc of the story, okay? Now, then 9-11 happens, and then almost, uh, basically a year later, the book is released. So it was uncanny, okay? I admit, I wasn't predicting this was gonna happen. I was writing a, a what-if scenario, a, a crazy, horrible scenario. Unfortunately, it, it, it felt like it was coming true. Again, I was not predicting, and the, my details were different. Uh, it's a Gulfstream 4 business jet. It's not a commercial 777 or 757. It's, um, uh, it, again, it flies into Denver, not to New York or Washington. There are a number of differences, but still. So basically, to try to get somebody to put me on their show to get, so we could talk and get, get people to be aware of the novel, um, my publicist sends a copy to the highest rated um, morning radio show host in my home city. I, I, I live in a little town of 5,000 called Fairport, New York. I did at the time. But the closest city was Rochester, New York, home of Kodak, Xerox, Bausch & Lomb, and so forth. And so the highest rated show uh, was a morning show on an acid rock uh, format. I never listened to it as a kid, but anyway, there's a guy named Brother Wheeze who was the morning show host, and he was big in our city. So... Uh, uh, so WCMF, 96 FM. And so uh, they sent it to him, and he read it, and he decided to have me on. Hometown boy, writes a novel, kind of uncanny. Okay. So it's, it's the first show on the first full day of, of the tour, uh, and I'm on by phone, and he says, dude, dude, this is whack, dude. I mean, come on. 
You write a novel that opens up with a radical Muslim terror group hijacking a plane and flying into a city? Dude, how did you know? Well, sir, I, you know, I didn't really know. I was just you know, making it up. But, yeah, but, but dude, I mean, come on. How, how did you cook, cook up that idea? I mean, that's, that's crazy, dude. So we started to talk about it. He said, now, okay, now, now, you've got this in your novel. The American president goes to war with Iraq. And now President Bush is saying that we might have to go to war with Iraq. I mean, that's the big national debate now. We may be going to war in the next few months. Dude, how did you know? Well, I didn't really know. I, I'm, we, you know we don't know what's going to happen. And I'm just projecting a fictional scenario. It's like a war game. Okay, but dude, dude, I, this is crazy. Then he goes, now, as we continue the conversation, he says, okay, dude, are you a heeb? I said, I'm sorry, what? That is not a nice thing to say. He goes, are you a Hebrew? I said, like in a Hebrew national hot dog? What? You know, and I just had never been called this before. He said, are you Jewish, dude? I said, oh, okay, uh, yes. On my father's side, I'm Jewish. I'm not Jewish on my mom's side. All right. He goes, I'm Jewish. I said, you're Jewish? His name was Brother Wheeze. <laughs> I, I, you know, I thought maybe he was a Jesuit or something. I didn't know. I, you know, I just, I never met him. I, so... I, he says, uh, he says so, so you're Jewish? I said, well, you know. And he says, all right, but, but at the end of your book, look, I read it all weekend. I mean, dude, but I read this book, and at the end of your book, you've got these characters, and they're all talking about, well, this is a terrible, a scary time to live, and all this terrorism, and what's going to happen next, and, you know, and what happens after we die? And uh, you got one character, he's like, you know, we got to believe in Jesus. I'm like, dude, what are you, a born again? What are you, an evangelical? And he said it like it was the most disgusting concept of some radioactive cocktail. You know. <laughs> it was like, you could hear it over the phone. It's just like, ugh. I said, well, um, I, I, I do believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And um, yes, he goes, dude, how, how, how is that even possible? You're Jewish. How can you believe, how can you be Jewish and believe in Jesus? I said, well, um, Mr. Weeze, it, it's an interesting story. Um, I don't know if we have time to get into it on your show, right? You know, he goes, All right, no, forget it. Are, are you kidding me? It's one thing to have a novelist whose book seems to be coming true, uh, you know, I, 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 a guy like that on my show, but to meet a Jew for, who believes in Jesus, this I got to hear, son. So I'm going to hold you over the break. We're going to finish the commercial. You're going to come back. And you're going to tell us your story. And that was the beginning. And in the next 60 days or so, I was on almost 160 radio and television shows. Many of them, not all of them, but many of them asked similar questions, though maybe not quite as uh, <laughs> flowery a way of, dude, dude, come on. Uh, but it became my favorite question. How can you be Jewish and believe in Jesus? And so let me give you a, the short rundown. Uh, well, Jesus was Jewish. You may, you may have heard that. Now, many Israelis think that he was Roman Catholic. They just don't, they actually don't know. Jesus is the most famous Israeli in human history, and most Israelis don't know anything about him. And they believe he's an Italian Roman Catholic. I mean, they, that's the paintings they see, the movies. They, they just equate it with not them, not one of their team, our team. And uh, the disciples, you may have heard, I think, you know, uh, they're Jewish. All the disciples, original disciples, are Jewish. And uh, so the thing was that my father and mother, when they, got, when they met and got married in 1965, they were agnostics. Now, my father had been born and raised in an Orthodox Jewish home in Brooklyn. His family had escaped as Orthodox Jews out of Russia in the early years of the 20th century, around 1906. They hid in a hay wagon that was leaving uh, Semitic, anti-Semitic, fascist, czarist Russia. And czarist soldiers at the borders plunged their swords into the hay to see if anyone was hiding in the, in the hay. And by God's grace, this unsaved Jewish family, uh, you know, no one was injured. Um, no one made a sound. Nobody sneezed. None of the kids said, are we there yet? <laughs> I got to go to the bathroom. And uh, they got out. And having gotten out of anti-Semitic, czarist, fascist Russia, they, they could have settled in Central or Eastern Europe, like many Russian Jews did, trying to find peace, trying to find quiet, trying to find 
shelter and safety. And many did, and, and many ended up dying just a few years later in the Holocaust. But again, by the grace of God, God's sovereign kindness to us, he moved us across the continent of Europe, put that family on a steamship and got them to the United States. And like any good Jewish family, they set up shop in Brooklyn. That's how it's done. And uh, so my father and his brother were first generation Americans born uh, to a family uh, who'd escaped. And, uh, but without going into their whole story, and that's a fun story of how my father came to faith uh, and how my mother, my mother's now a Gentile. She's daughters of the American Revolution, English Methodist wasp. Okay, so this is quite an interesting uh, combo platter here. Uh, now, my father had become an agnostic by the time he met her. He had rejected uh, his family and his, the synagogue and Orthodox Judaism. Lots of tensions, lots of problems. Uh, can't unpack all of it tonight. But there, and he was a big part of it. He was uh, an angry, bitter person and not happy with his family. His family wasn't nice to him either. But anyway, so he was an agnostic, didn't know what he believed. My mom, had, uh, if you go back at just a few generations in her family, they had circuit riding, gospel preaching, Methodist missionaries. My middle name is Cooper, named for Judson Cooper, who was a pastor and a Methodist uh, uh, gospel preacher in central New York. So that was in her family, but by her generation, they went to a little church that didn't believe in Jesus, didn't preach the gospel, didn't understand. She didn't understand that you had to be born again or even how that would work. So they began to read the, the Quran together, my parents, as they got started in their life. They were searching. It was the 60s. But fortunately, they didn't become Muslims. Um, uh, then they read the Bhagavad Gita, and they thought, maybe we'll be Hindus. And then that didn't take. Okay, thank you, Lord. And uh, then they went to a church, and eventually, eventually, they heard the gospel. My mom came to faith in Jesus Christ first, and she was truly born again in, in the spring of 1973, and then begged my father to join a small group Bible study of some young married couples that were going to go through the book of Luke. Now, my father didn't believe and he didn't really want to believe, but he, he, was, he thought, you know, to know the basic plot of the New Testament uh, is sort of like knowing basic Shakespeare. Every American should have the, you know, the cliff notes. So sure, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll join that Bible study. And so it was after six months of studying through the book of Luke that my father came home one day and said, I can't believe I'm saying this to you, but I have come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. I've read this and I believe it and I've given my life to Jesus. Now, this was a big spiritual revolution in our family. And, um, and my father, so this is the fall of 1973. My father thought he was the first Jew since the apostle Paul <laughs> to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He had never heard of a Jewish person believing this. He had never met one for sure. And in 1973, there weren't that many. Uh, best research we've been able to do is that in 1967, when I was born, there was maybe, maybe 2,000 Jewish people on planet Earth who believed that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, and, uh, and he's the only way to get to heaven, the only way to have our sins atoned for. 2,000 in, in all of the world? Uh, now, today, uh, the, the numbers are dramatically higher, and that's one of the things we're excited about. Um, uh, the Joshua Fund uh, f helped partially finance a study from the Southern Baptists. It uh, uh, came out about a year, year and a half ago, and it, it, that study found there are today, in America alone, 871,000 Jewish followers of Jesus. That's an amazing concept that we have gone from fewer than 2,000 to almost 900,000 just in America. And if you add what's going on in other parts of the world, we're roughly at a million Jewish followers of Jesus in a world of 17 million Jews. That's extraordinary. Because for most of human history, for the last 2,000 years, there was almost, almost zero not zero, but almost zero Jewish response to the gospel. Uh, and, and, and yet now we're in this moment that's so dramatic. And, uh, and I'm one of them. I, you know, I came to faith uh, through the, the, the witness and the teaching of my parents and our Sunday school teachers and our vacation Bible school teachers. And I came to faith when I was eight years old, 1975. I, I have to admit, thank God for all those people, but I hated Sunday school. 
and, and vacation Bible school was worse. <laughs> in, in, in Sunday school, we had these things. I don't know if you forced your kids. I mean, you know, encouraged your kids here at Rock Point to do sword drills. Ready? John 3.16. And whoever finds it first, right, gets points. And then eventually you get a baseball bat and a ball or something. And I'm like, you know, they'd say, ready, John 3, 16. I'd be like, what? There's a Mark, there's a Jenny, there's a Carrie, there's a Nancy. I, where's the John? I don't understand what you're talking about. I had, no, I, was, I had no idea about the Bible. I was completely illiterate, biblically illiterate. Um, and because I had the gift of obliviousness, I didn't seem to know how to play this game. Like, get me a Bible. I've got to study it. I didn't, it took me several years for me to go to my parents and go, listen, I'm getting smoked in this game. You're, you're killing me. You can't put me in this class I want that bat. I want that ball. And, you know, but I need a Bible. It took me years before I said that. Not that bright, but still, God can use anybody, right? And so, so they got me a little uh, uh, Gideon New Testament, right, with Psalms and Proverbs in the back. So it was just the New Testament and Psalms and Proverbs. So I began leafing through it. I wasn't that interested. I was just trying to get the basics for the game. So I kept, get, I kept losing. I kept losing. But, if, but one day, they were like, ready? What's the last book of the Bible? Ooh, ooh. And they were all shocked that Joel Rosenberg had just raised his hand. They're like, wow, well, this could be progress. Fantastic. And the teacher said, Joel, what's the last book of the Bible? Proverbs. <laughs> You're bringing them back a lot of bad memories right now. That's what they did. They laughed. They said, no, I'm sorry, Joel, it's Revelation. Not my Bible. No, baby, look at this. See, see, Proverbs, Proverbs. Fork it over. You know you want to give it to me. Come on, come on. I'm doing the work. I'm not a slacker. Come on. They wouldn't give it to me. And I have to say, I'm a little bitter still. I, I, I actually was telling that story in Jerusalem at a church once, and uh, it, was, it was webcast. And, and lo and behold, the Sunday school teacher that had been my Sunday school teacher, saw this, just was surfing through the video web one day, came across this video, couldn't believe that she had rediscovered me watching this thing. And then I guess I didn't really say, and thank you to my Sunday school teachers and my, you know, my vacation Bible school teachers for all that care and love for me. I didn't actually say that so she could tell I was actually a little bit better. And um, so she tracked me down and she sent me a whiff ball bat and a ball, okay? So, thank you. Now, the only thing worse, uh, admittedly, uh, the only thing worse than Sunday school was vacation Bible school, right? Because, listen, we went to a church where in the summer they let the kids off, right? The kids had more time. Why teach them about the Bible? So we, had, we didn't have Sunday school. So my parents said, don't worry. We're signing you up for vacation Bible school. I said, what's that? Well, you go every day. What? One minute, I'm like, thank God almighty, I'm free at last. And now, every day? Are you kidding me? And you know what vacation Bible school is, right? Look, I don't like to sing. I don't like to do crafts. I'm not a big fan of flannel. And I got to say, I can think of a lot of ways to spend my summer morning better than gluing elbow macaroni to burlap to write Jesus loves me. I mean, you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> and yet... Somehow, thank you to all my teachers who loved me and kept, kept loving me and kept teaching me about Jesus. And I, I did come to faith and eventually, you know, got excited about this. And uh, so when I, when I, uh, so I went to Syracuse University and I studied filmmaking. I wanted to learn how to tell, tell stories. I, I wanted to write novels someday, but I didn't know if I could make a living at it. I thought filmmaking, filmmaking might be a better skill set to learn, and I could either go into commercial storytelling or maybe into news and just make things up. Either way, I was going to be a fake news journalist, whatever. But, uh, and in, and in, at Syracuse University, I, I met my wife, uh, Lynn. She's from New Jersey. I'm from New York. I had to get rid of all my New Jersey jokes. Uh, most people from New Jersey don't realize that they're just the punchline for, for New Yorkers. So we had to work through that in our marriage. And anyway, um, so anyway, long story short, um, she was a creative writing English major and a Jewish studies minor. She's not Jewish, but she just, God had put on her heart this, this love for Jewish people. We met in Campus Crusade for Christ, and we just fell in love, and the Lord was, you know, in it. And, and we had a pastor who was from India, and he used to say, Joel, lean, 
we serve a prayer, hearing, and a prayer, answering God, a wonder-working God. And we're like, what? <laughs> we often needed English to English translation. I, he was speaking English, but anyway, so in case you missed that, Joel and Lynn, we serve a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God, a wonder-working God. And we saw this man show us what it means to pray and see prayers answered. And, and we eventually applied that with our children uh, in many ways, and we saw God do all kinds of crazy, interesting things. And, you know, that first novel, The Last Jihad, became number one on Amazon, 11 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. And again, I got to talk to millions of people and often about my faith in Jesus. And that set into motion a career. I, I didn't expect it. You know, you pray for, you know, we pray for things, but then we don't really believe God's really going to do it. We know he can, but, you know, oh, Lord, please let Peter out of prison. We pray, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Who is it? It's Peter. Yeah, really, sure. Okay, Lord, we pray that you just... <laughs> You know, the little, the little servant girl, uh, Peter's at the door. Yeah, yeah, just go. It's, I'm sure it's his ghost, right, or his, his angel, right? Just keep praying. Like, we just don't, we're just not always sure he's really going to do it. But as I was uh, speaking around the country and, and, and doors were opening to, to talk about these novels at all kinds of venues, but increasingly now at churches and, and Christian conferences, people, would, people were saying, you're writing, Joel, in your novels about worst case scenarios that could happen in the Middle East, but... Bad things are happening in the Middle East, right? We have a war in Iraq. We have a war in Afghanistan. We have uh, you know, the, the scourge of radical Islamism. Not all of Islam. That's a theological challenge for the church. But the vast majority of Muslims aren't our enemy. But, but those who are, are, right? So uh, you're, you're writing and telling us about these things. But what can we do? How can we reach Jewish people and Muslims with the gospel? And that was the question I kept getting in, in various, various forms wherever I was traveling. But I would come home frustrated because I'd say, honey, I don't know how to answer this question, these, this set of questions, because it takes a long time to explain every, how would I explain every ministry that's going on in the Middle East, uh, the ones that we know about, and then are they trustworthy? Are they, do they use the money wisely? Are they theologically reasonably healthy? Are they heading in the right direction? What's the address? How do you invest? What do you do? It's impossible to end, uh, you know, uh, either a sermon or if you're giving a, a, like a talk about your book and then you take questions. How am I going to answer that? That's, there's no way to do it in, in, in such a way that will help really answer the question that people would know how to, if they want to send $25 or $25,000, what would they do? I don't have the answer, honey. And we started praying about that. Lord, you're prompting a question that you must have an answer to because we don't have the answer. Call to me and I will answer you, says the Lord, and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. And that's where the Joshua Fund was born. Uh, we started in 2006 and the, the basic premise was, uh, what we were saying publicly was to, we want to mobilize and educate Christians, educate and mobilize Christians to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus, according to the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, where God famously takes Abram out of Iraq, right, Mesopotamia, and he sends him to the land I will show you. And he says, I will bless those who bless you, and those who curse you, I will curse. So we knew we wanted to help Christians understand God's heart for Israel and her neighbors. We don't believe that God only loves Jewish people. Now, part of the church's problem historically is Many have believed that God does not love the Jewish people, that God's done with the Jewish people. This is called supersessionism. This is the theological view that Jesus, our Jews rejected Jesus, therefore Jesus rejected the Jews, and that all the promises that God made to ethnic national Israel now belong to the church, and there is no role, no place, no plan in God's economy for Israel and the Jewish people. He's done with us. Now, that's not true. If it were true, if it was true that, that, that when Israel as a nation uh, turned over Jesus to the Romans and the Romans crucified him in, you know, 31, 32, 33 AD, whenever it was exactly, if that was the moment that God rejected his people, the Jewish chosen people, that, you know, then how did Paul get saved? 
How did any Jewish person in the book of Acts get saved if God was already done with the Jewish people because of the rejection of the Jews? Now, it says right in John chapter 1, to his men, to, you know, or he, the Messiah, came to his own. What own? His own, the, the, the Jewish people, the, the nation of Israel, through whom the prophecies say the Messiah will come, right? He, the Messiah, came to his own, Israel, the Jewish people. But his own received him not, right? We didn't welcome him and say yes to Jesus. But the Bible says, John says, to as many as received him, the Gentiles, to them he gave, to you he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So God knew that, he, that, the, that the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone was going to be rejected by the builders, right? He knew this. This was part of the plan. And he knew that he would eventually draw the Jewish people in small numbers over the years, but eventually he would show tremendous grace on us. And he would pour out his spirit and draw the Jewish people into the kingdom, that he would open our eyes, that he'd open our hearts. And what's fascinating to me is that we live in that season, that after 2,000 years of very few Jewish people receiving Jesus as Messiah, now we're in the season where upwards of a million out of 17 million Jews have come to receive Jesus as the Messiah, as the Lord, as the only way to get to God. That we can't just celebrate as we did last week, observe um, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. That is not how we can have our sins atoned, in part because there's no temple. And if there's no temple, there's no place to, to follow the procedures of the law to sacrifice a perfect animal and have our sins covered for that year. There's no place to do that anymore. Only, and, and, and God, but God did not allow the temple to be destroyed until the Messiah had already come. The temple's destruction in part is judgment on the nation of Israel, but it's also was superfluous. It was unnecessary. You did not need the temple when you had the Messiah, one sacrifice for all. But the problem for the, in the Jewish community worldwide is, is very few Jews have actually heard the message. What we're living now in is a season where when Jews do hear the message and are prayed for, loved, increasingly they're saying, wow, I didn't realize this. They're doing what my father was doing, was coming home and saying, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I believe in Jesus. I believe in Yeshua. I believe that Jesus is our Messiah, and I want to receive him, I, and, and I want to be born again. I want to be grafted back in to spiritual Israel and spend eternity with God. And now I need to go tell other people, most Jews have not rejected the gospel. They, most Jews have not heard the gospel. Most Jews are rejecting the history of Christianity. They're rejecting the Crusades. They're rejecting the Inquisition. They're rejecting the pogroms, the Russian season um, uh, when the Tsar was in charge and the Russian Orthodox Church encouraged and, and supported these terrible uh, persecutions and attacks against the Jews that left more than 60,000 Jews dead. Many raped and, and beaten and their homes destroyed and their possessions looted. And, and, and they see it, and many Jews see that as as part of the church. That's part of Christianity. Hitler. We know Hitler was an antichrist figure, little a, little c. But his, his people, the Nazis who were running the death camps like Auschwitz, they, many of them described themselves as Lutheran Christians. And they would gas Jews six days a week. And on Sunday, they would sing hymns on the way to the little chapel at Auschwitz they'd sing about Jesus. If you're a Jewish person who knows that history, it's very hard to convince you that this book isn't an anti-Semitic handbook. So most Jews stay away from it. But there's only one way to be saved. Yes, we are the chosen people in the sense that God chose us to give us first dibs, first opportunity to know him and make him known. But it's not enough that we are chosen by God. We have to choose him back. We're no different from you. Except that we have a history. We have a history of rejecting Jesus, and we have a history of not reading the scriptures, and we have a history of being provoked, not lovingly, by the Gentile church. That's a lot of reasons why we don't come to Jesus historically. But Paul makes it very clear in Romans, in chapter 1, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first, 
and also for the Greek, meaning the Greek speaker, meaning Gentiles, right? The world was pretty much divided in their world, Jew and other, and that was a Greek speaker. So he's saying to Jews and Gentiles, this is the, 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 the gospel is the power of salvation. It's the only way to get saved. And I'm not ashamed of it, Paul says. I'll preach it to anybody, Jew or Gentile. In fact, everywhere I go, I'll, my pattern is I'll go and preach to Jews first. I will get beaten up. Some will receive it. Some, most won't. I'll get beaten up or stoned or whatever. And then I'll move on to the next uh, synagogue in the next town if God lets me. I want my people to know because he gets to the middle of the book of Romans or two thirds through, right? He, chapter 10, he says, how are they going to believe if they haven't even heard the gospel? But how are they going to hear the gospel if nobody tells them? And how will people tell them unless they're sent, right? And, and, and with the sending comes the, 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 the call. Come reach Jewish people with the gospel. Come reach Muslim with the people. How is anybody going to hear the gospel unless someone goes and tells them? But, and at this season where Jews and Muslims have been the most resistant to the gospel of any people group on earth, Jews above all. If it was easy to reach Israel and the Jewish people with the gospel, it would be done by now. We're the first country. We're the first people group that heard. Right? We're like the alpha and omega of missions. Like, we got it first, but we have been the most resistant historically. But things are changing. We're at, this, we're at this season where the curtain of Jewish response to the gospel is going up. And even Jews who haven't received are listening. But it's important that the church be communicating. And this is really the heart of the Joshua Fund. How do we make sure that every Jew and Gentile in the land of Israel hears the gospel of Jesus Christ? Again, if it were easy, you'd think, how is it even possible that that's hard to do? There's 9 million people living in the, 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 the land, the footprint of, of Israel. About two-thirds of those are Jews. About a third of those are Arabs. How hard is it? We're reaching China. We're reaching India. We're reaching Brazil. Yeah, but it's hard. I, I, I can't explain it. I just know from personal experience it is difficult. So this is what we're trying to be engaged in. And, and so the Joshua Fund, uh, but we, again, we, not only with Jews, then the, with Muslims also. So Israel, uh, Joshua Fund focuses on Israel, the Palestinians, and then people in five neighboring Arab countries, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, and Egypt. And so we're not just trying to reach everybody with the gospel. We're also trying to strengthen the church in the epicenter to fulfill the Great Commission. Our main goal is, we're a fund. Our main goal is not to do the ministry primarily, though we do a lot of hands-on ministry ourselves, especially now that Lynn and I and the boys live there. We live in Jerusalem. So we, we're happy that God wants to have us be a witness for him in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and even at the uttermost Scandinavian parts of the earth. <laughs> right? So that's why I'm here. But, but that we're actually right there in the epicenter of the epicenter. And it's exciting. But... But uh, so we're there, but we're mainly uh, as a ministry trying to strengthen the local believers to, to uh, encourage them, pray for them, equip them, resource them, fund them so that they can reach the people of the region, of their nation in their heart languages, knowing the culture the way they do. And it's exciting. In, in 1948, there were only 23 known Jewish followers of Jesus in the entire country of Israel. In 1948, when it was prophetically reborn. 23, that section. Today, a study that just came out from the Israel College of the Bible, the main Bible training school there, uh, that is a, something that Joshua Fund invests in significantly, there are now some 30,000 Jewish followers of Jesus. So now, in a, in a land of 6.8 million Jews, that's not enough. But when you think of 71 years and we've got more than a thousand fold increase, okay, there's movement, there's movement, but much more needs to be done. And that, so from the, from the leadership of the Joshua Fund, what our, what our focus is, we think of ourselves as a venture capital firm, a spiritual venture capital firm. We are identifying, vetting small but promising ministries seriously focused on preaching the gospel, making disciples, training up young people, uh, equipping future pastors, helping people in marketplace ministries, caring for Holocaust survivors, caring for refugees, all the various aspects of, of the gospel ministry from, that Jesus laid out. We want to 
equip them. We want to invest in them and help them grow. Just as if you lived in Silicon Valley and you were a VC, you'd say, all right, I want to go find some, some b- bunch of young people in their garage. They're cu- cooking up the next app, the ne- next killer app, whatever is their, the technology. How can we help them? How can we provide financial advice, management assistance, marketing assistance? What can we do to help you get your product done and onto the market and having big impact in the world? That's the ministry of the Joshua as venture capitalists, spiritually speaking. From the donor perspective, it's, it, it, it's a little bit different, meaning I think from, from if your perspective, if you want to get involved, it's like, it's like a mutual fund. You say, yeah, I, I have a heart to reach Israel and the neighbors with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I wouldn't know the first thing. I don't have time or, 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 or the language set or, or, or whatever to go over and meet every pastor, every ministry, every congregation and, and, and analyze whether they're seriously healthy in their, uh, in their theology, if they have the resources to do what they say they're going to do with their projects, if they're using the money at all or, you know, are they building chalets up, you know, in Paris or what, you know, what are, they, what are they actually doing with the money? So from a mutual fund that you're not, you know, you don't have to be a, a stock picker. You don't have to do all your own research. You can say, well, if you see the Joshua Fund as a trusted resource, wonderful. Then we want to help ministries, individuals, congregations, small group Bible studies say, we want to make a difference. We want to reach the most unreached peoples of the world, which ultimately are Jews and Muslims. There are many other options and many other needs. And if the Lord doesn't call you to be involved in the Joshua Fund, we get it. But but a lot of people do have a desire, but they but how are they going to know unless somebody goes out and tells them? And how can we equip people to go reach the people of Israel and the Middle East unless, unless we fund them, unless we encourage them, unless we help them? That's what we're doing. And I love it. And I don't want to be a novelist. I mean, I do, but I don't. Uh, I would just want to do that. But we've got a great team, a great board, uh, which now you know uh, is, is a significant element of it, is from Rock Point. We've got a great team. Uh, the, the, the sun never sets on the Joshua Fund Empire. Uh, when I say that, I mean we don't have an office. We don't spend any money on a, on, a, on a headquarters. Everybody works out of their homes. And we have people on the East Coast and in the Virginia area all the way out to San Diego. We've got people in Singapore, and we've got people in Israel. So we just keep moving work you know, eastward, and it just keeps coming around, and, and a lot of exciting work is getting done. And we'd be, I'd be happy to answer questions about it. I'm feeling like I haven't gotten to the pictures and the delegation, so should I take another few minutes on that, or should we make that part of the Q&A? Keep going. Okay. So let me take a few minutes. So this is an area. So, so we heard that Paul's role was to reach Gentiles, kings, and the sons of Israel with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Bear witness to them. Now, when you start a ministry and you're a failed political consultant and, you know, you're, you make things up for a living, you're not thinking, okay, how do we reach the kings? You know, how do we reach, you know, that's not, I mean, honestly, that was not really a part of our thing. We pray for kings and all those in authority because that's what Paul tells us to do. But Paul tells us also to be imitators of him, right? First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Be imitators of me just as I am also of Christ. So we want to reach Jews and Gentiles. We weren't really thinking so much about kings, to be honest. But we were praying for all the leaders in the Middle East. And then a few years ago, the doors began to open. So the way they opened was I began, I wrote a, a series of three novels in which ISIS, the Islamic State, captures chemical weapons in Syria and then, then is planning a series of genocidal attacks against Israel, the United States, and other neighbors. And in that first novel, it was called The Third Target in that series, uh, ISIS plots to blow up the... Uh, the castle of King Abdullah of Jordan, kill the king, and take over the kingdom of Jordan. Now, for some reason, I decided to make King Abdullah a character by name. Not that bright. (laughs) If you're a next-door neighbor of a Sunni Arab monarch who's a direct descendant of Muhammad, should you really write a thriller where he and his family are being targeted and hunted by ISIS and their palace is blown up and, you know, all kinds of mayhem. Is that really the best way to witness to him? <laughs> well, anyway, it's what I did. And as it happens, one of his advisors read the second book in the series 
Uh, he, was, he was going through Heathrow Airport. He saw, he didn't know me, didn't know about the book, but he saw the cover, looked interesting, grabbed a copy, and was reading it on a flight to Washington where he was going to meet His Majesty King Abdullah II. As he's reading the book, he's like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. The palace is on fire. The king is flying his own Black Hawk helicopter in retreat uh, to regroup with his forces and build a counterattack against ISIS. He's like, oh my gosh, what is happening in this book? By the time he gets to Washington, he goes to the Four Seasons Hotel. He goes to the king's suite and he says, your majesty, you have to read this. He says, why? Because you're in it. What? It, it, it looks like a novel. What are you talking about? I know, but you're a named character in the book. Now, as it happens, uh, President Obama, who was the, the, they were there to see the next day, President Obama, for some reason, decided that he was too busy and he, he didn't have time for the king, that they would have to reschedule. But the king is already in Washington. And he's got other meetings with cabinet officials and congressional leaders. So they stay, but suddenly he doesn't have two, uh, two days worth of activities on his schedule, the, a day of prepping for his meeting with the president, the half days of meetings with the president, and the half days of debriefing with his team. So he's got two days free, so he reads the novel. It was called The First Hostage. <laughs> so he sends this advisor. He says, who is this guy? He goes, I, I don't know. Well, go have lunch with him. See if he's a nut. <laughs> so he has lunch with me. He comes back, and he goes, uh, he is a nut. And, uh, well, go, go have dinner with him and see if he's a dangerous nut. And so then he had dinner with me. And in the end, Lynn and I received an invitation from the palace in Amman to come and have five days with the king and his senior advisors to get to know them. Essentially, we learned, it was to, the king wanted to show us what he's doing to make sure my books never come true, okay? <laughs> so the first day we met him, uh, we flew over from, his, from Jerusalem, uh, from Israel. We got there and, uh, and we met with him. He said, you know, I was wondering where it would be fun to meet you for the first time, but since you blew up my palace, I thought I would bring you to the palace so you could see, you know, what the damage, you know, that we don't want this to happen. And I said, yes, no, this is gorgeous. I, I love this. So, uh, and then he said, you know, I see that you made me a character, but I also see that my senior advisors, they're all fictional names, but I can see who's who. So I buy copies of the book and I give them to each member and I say, this is you. You don't make it through the terrorist attack. Read that. <laughs> Now, as it happens, um, he had read the second in the series. It was a trilogy, and I was writing the third, but I brought him copies of the first. I said, can I just show you? Let's, let's see the first. Oh, uh, that's me. Okay. Uh, first picture. So that's Lynn and me with his majesty, uh, King Abdullah II. Uh, and we just had lunch with him. And, uh, and I said to him, you know, your majesty, um, you read the second in the series, so you might want to read the first, uh, get the backstory and understand how this all came about. So I brought you some copies. Now, they're written in the first person. Can I just show you the first sentence of the first page of the first novel in the series? Sure. Well, it reads, I had never met a king before. So he laughed. He thought that was funny. And, and uh, so he, he, he decides to write, well, you have now. <laughs> so this is the king signing the book back to me. And there's the line. Well, you have now King Abdullah II. So we spent five days. Uh, Lynn was only able to come for two because we'd had a commitment with one of our sons. She came for two. I stayed for five. Fascinating. He put us in his private helicopter, flew us around the country to meet with, with commanders, generals, uh, intelligence officials, trying to understand the ISIS threat, what's happening, how they're trying to make sure this never happens to their country. And uh, it, was, it was just unbelievable. He sent us to biblical sites, uh, Petra, Jerash. The last night, he invited me to a private dinner with him at his private palace. Um, we had a two and a half hour dinner with just a few close personal friends of his, and we just talked about everything. And at the end, I said, you know, Your Majesty, I had a, a great affection and, and admiration for you um, before I came. I mean, and by the way, it's how interesting, not just to invite a novelist, but an American, Israeli, evangelical, Jewish novelist who blows up your palace, you know, to invite that guy. <laughs> so um, I said, I, I, thank you. We've learned so much. And I'm just wondering if you would be open 
to other evangelical leaders coming and meeting with you, doing what we've done to learn. You know, many of them love Israel deeply, but they needed to understand what's going on in the neighbors. And, and you know, how amazing to meet a king of, of your stature and of your moderation and uh, you're willing to fight these radicals, um, even though you're you know, as a Muslim. And uh, what, what about maybe doing a delegation? He said, that would be a great idea. Would you, could we, could we work together and put such a delegation together? And so we did. And uh, the following year, um, I brought uh, a delegation, including uh, a Rock Point member, uh, former Congresswoman Michelle Bachman. See there, her there on the right. And uh, on, uh, flanking on either side are, the, are two young men. Uh, the one on the, uh, the right side of the photo is uh, my son Jonah, and uh, the other side is Jacob. So actually, I should have reversed that because it's uh, Jacob and Jonah are the middle two, and Jacob is older. But they got to come and be part of this delegation. And what a fascinating thing. I would have given both of my arms when I was a kid to get an opportunity to go meet a king and, and sit with these, uh, these top leaders. We met with Christian, Jordanian Christian leaders, evangelicals. We met with top Muslim clerics. We met with the cabinet. Then I flew home... Um, well, I'm sorry, matching these together, I'll just tell you a couple other real quick things, and then we'll pick up more as we go through the Q&A. But I, 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 uh, before we put this delegation together, or as we were doing it, I happened to be back in Washington a few months later. And even though I've been praying for King Abdullah, I was also praying we, at our team. We were praying for all the leaders in the region. So an, an open door came for me to meet with King, uh, sorry, President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, the president of Egypt. And so I got this opportunity to go. It wasn't just me. It was like 60 Middle East experts. But at the end of the two-hour Q&A session with him, he stood up. His entourage stood up. We all assumed he would leave. But he didn't. He just was chatting with people at the head table. Well, the type of people that were in this room uh, are the type, you know, former assistant secretary of that and undersecretary of this and ambassador for that and secretary of this. So they know you don't rush up to the stage and get a, a selfie with Cece. Right? It's just not done. But I'm not a former anybody. I'm a failed political consultant who's getting the first opportunity to meet the president of Egypt. I'm like, oh, I'd like to go meet him. So unless the Secret Service is going to tackle me, I'm going to work my way around and nobody tackle me. Next thing I know, I'm shaking hands with the president of Egypt. And I say, Mr. President, I want to thank you for rescuing 100 million Egyptians from the tyranny of the Muslim Brotherhood terrorists. Um, thank you. He says, well, you're welcome. And thank you for all you're doing to protect Christians in Egypt. Uh, you're rebuilding all the churches that were burned down and, and defaced and destroyed during this period and of terror and civil war and re revolution. Thank you for this. I know there's a lot more to do, but I just want to say thank you personally. I'm a Christian. Well, you're welcome. I see that you're meeting with Jewish leaders and Coptic Orthodox Christian leaders, Roman Catholic leaders. I appreciate, I don't remember any Egyptian leader sort of building these interfaith relationships with people that weren't Muslims. And I just want to say thank you for that. Well, you're welcome. We're trying to take Egypt in a new direction. I said, now, this is not a criticism, but I haven't noticed that you have invited any uh, evangelical Christians to meet with you. Maybe you have, and I just haven't heard the news. He goes, no, I don't, I don't think I have. I said, well, you might want to do that. There are some 60 million evangelical Christians in the United States, and some 600 million Worldwide, It's an influential group spiritually, culturally, politically, in other ways. So I'm, I'm working on putting together a delegation with King Abdullah, and it's just something you might want to consider. Now, we're six minutes into a conversation. He has no idea who I am. I just walked up to him. Nobody's still behind me in line, so we keep going. <laughs> and he says, well, would you like to bring in such a delegation? And I said, well, I'll have to pray about that. Mm, yes. <laughs> We already had prayed about it, but I, I wasn't thinking, I mean, I was just trying to plant a seed. A seed. I didn't think it would, you know, have miracle grow with it, and it would, it would just, <laughs> boom. And so we chatted, but what would that look like? How would it be structured? And then after about the nine-minute mark, he, we turn, and he says to his foreign minister, his chief of staff, and the Egyptian ambassador to the U.S., gentlemen, make this thing happen. So I step aside. I exchange cards with them. We chat. I get on a plane. I fly back to Israel. A few days later, it's Passover. And uh, it's Passover, so I, I, we, I'm at the home. Our next-door neighbors at the time is the president of the Israel College of the Bible, the head of the Messianic Jewish ministry, training people in the scriptures. 
uh, again, a, a major receiver of Joshua Fund investment, his wife, some of the professors from the school and so forth, and all their families and kids and, and our kids, my wife. And they're like, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. You met with the president of Egypt? What was that like? What happened? That's crazy. I said, this is how crazy it is. Imagine being a Jewish man standing before the leader of Egypt on the eve of Passover and saying, let my people come. <laughs> that is not how the story goes, right? So there we are. <laughs> I thought maybe God would harden his heart. You know, I read the story, so... There we are. I'm sitting next to the president um, up at the front. We had a, it was supposed to be a one-hour meeting with him. We went three hours. We talked about every topic, religious freedom, uh, human rights, uh, Egypt's relationship with Israel. We talked about the prophecies of Isaiah 19 with him. We, I, I explained to him that uh, Egypt is mentioned in the Bible more than any other country except e Israel, that God loves the people of Egypt. We talked, it was amazing we, that Jesus, of course, visited Egypt, right? You know, y'all know that because uh, uh, Joseph and Mary take baby Jesus and flee there when Herod is going to kill all the babies in, in Bethlehem. So it was just an amazing thing. And then, then he said, let's get a picture. And so they line us all up. Again, um, you'll see uh, uh, Rock Point's uh, uh, member, uh, Michelle Bachman, in the, uh, in the white jacket there. Uh, I'm at the other side, and it was extraordinary. The man in the purple shirt is the head of all the Egyptian Christian Protestant evangelicals in the country, some two million of them. And we didn't want to work around the local believers. We want to work with the local believers. And so it was very special that he was with us. I gave him the opportunity to ask the first question, and, and the protocol people put him right next to each other. I won't go through all the stories, but just showing you that uh, then as this made front page news in all the papers in Egypt, Jordan, and throughout the region, I got contacted by the United Arab Emirates ambassador to Washington saying, would you come and meet with our crown prince, Mohammed bin Zayed? And this is us meeting with him last uh, November. Uh, another delegation you might see behind the, the, the crown prince is Kay Arthur. Uh, she was with us. Um, and then we were invited to Saudi Arabia. And as it happens, it was, we were invited several months before the horrific, horrific, um, unconscionable murder of Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi, a Saudi national. We'd already said yes. Should we still go? But we prayed about it. We discussed it as a team, and we decided to go. Michelle was with us for that as well. Um, we decided to do it because... We had been told, I had been told by the foreign minister of Saudi Arabia before, before we went, he said, you're the first Christian leaders in 300 years of the Saud family control of Arabia who've ever been invited to the palace. I can't think of a single other example of this happening. And that was pretty amazing. So do you go or do you not go? Well, it, we, the murder was announced, we learned of it October 2nd and the days that followed. We were supposed to be there on November 1st. And, and a lot of information we didn't know. So, but if we don't go, we've become judge and jury. We've decided he's guilty, and uh, the crown prince, and, 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 and we might be blocking the door for anybody else. Now, the apostle Paul appealed to Nero, the Caesar. Nero was not a good guy, but Paul wanted to go talk to him about Jesus. Uh, Daniel met with Nebuchadnezzar, the man who invented, the king who invented throwing Jews into fiery furnaces. Do you go or do you not go? Right? Joseph before the Pharaoh. It's not exactly parallel, and I'm not saying that it is. I'm just saying that we are, if we're supposed to pray for kings and all those in authorities, and we are supposed to do what Paul does, which is bear the name of Jesus before Gentiles, kings, and the sons of Israel, and they, the Saudi royal family, the, 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 the heir to the throne, the effective operational officer of the Saudi kingdom, invites a Jewish American, Israeli, evangelical, with two kids in the Israeli army? That's not normal. <laughs> right? I remember, of the, it makes me think of uh, the old Sesame Street thing. One of these things is not like the other. <laughs> One of these things just doesn't belong. And um, that's me with the crown prince, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, talking. We, we, we had an opportunity to ask him, what are your prayer requests? I, we, we said to him, 
The Bible commands us to pray for kings and all those in authorities. How can we pray for you? We talked about the murder of Khashoggi. We asked him a lot of questions about it. We, um, we then asked him lots of questions. And at one point I said to him, uh, I noticed that you have met with the Coptic Orthodox Pope in Cairo under a painting of Jesus. I, I don't remember any Saudi leader ever doing that before. And he said, well, this is the new Saudi Arabia. We're trying to change. Now, I'm not asking you to believe whether he's changing or not. He's certainly making many changes. I'm just telling you the environment that we were operating in. And, uh, and then I said, you, then you went to London and you met with the Archbishop of Canterbury with a big metal cross around his neck. I'm not used to the head of the, you know, the, the heir to the throne of the, the birthplace of Islam meeting with Anglican Christian leaders. It doesn't happen. It's never happened. He said, well, we're trying to... We're trying to show our people that you can be a proud Muslim and still build a friendship with a Christian, have a dialogue. Look, how can they believe if they've never hear, heard? And if they're willing to come and meet with Christians, I, I believe we need to start that process, even though we don't agree with them on everything, and even if we might believe they've done bad things. So there we were, and then they invited us back. And so on the week of September 11th this year, the crown prince said, would you come back? And we did. And by the way, I'll say one other thing, and then we'll, we'll wrap up here. Uh, and I appreciate the, the extra time on this. But um, one of the things we said is, you know, you, you met with these various Christian leaders. Now you, we're the first ones, first Christian leaders ever to come to your palace. This was last year. Uh, and um, I said to the crown prince, you know, uh, I'm guessing that the term evangelical Christian is not a term used much here in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Is that a fair uh, assessment? And he said, yes, I think he laughed. He said, I think that's fair. Well, we have, um, we have an, uh, an ordained pastor as part of our delegation. And I'm wondering, could he just take a moment and explain what does it mean to be an evangelical Christian and what is it that we believe? And he said, yes, of course, we, I would love that. Thank you. And, and this pastor just got to walk through what it is that we believe. Imagine, imagine. I, when we, look, when Paul was sent to Gentiles, kings, and the sons of Israel, it didn't mean that he was going to believe everything they believe or going to embrace everything that they've done in their life. The point is to bear witness for the name of Jesus. How can they hear if they've never met anybody who loves Jesus? I believe, and our team of the Joshua Fund, we believe that every person in the world needs a friend who loves Jesus. That how, you know, otherwise they're not going to have an access um, to, to know him. And uh, so we went again. Uh, this is us on the, one of the front pages of a Saudi paper. We were on all the Arabic and English Saudi newspapers and throughout the region. Evangelicals meeting with the crown prince. Not once, but twice. Um, we're, we're, not in a, we're not in normal times. And... Um, God is opening these doors, and the, and, and the Joshua one's goal is both to invest in Jewish and Muslim evangelism, strengthen the church in the Middle East, and, and then teach the church around the world God's heart for Jews and Arabs. And having a chance to take uh, evangelical leaders from various places, including Rock Point, to the region to meet leaders that were unlikely to ever meet before, or, you know, God is doing something special. This has been very, very important, to develop balance in the church and God's heart for both Jews and Arabs. It's not either or. Too many evangelicals talk about that part of the world as either or. Either we love Arabs and Jews are, you know, doing the wrong thing in Israel. Look, many of us are. But that's also true of the other side. And, and so it's not either or. It's both and. God loves both. That was Paul. Was, that was his job to preach to both. That's our job. That's what we do. And who knew that a failed political consultant from a little tiny town in upstate New York um, who, write, who makes things up for a living, that God would open doors such as these. But we're honored, and I'm happy to, uh, to take questions. So let's take a moment and uh, shift gears. Thank you. All right, well, thank you. I know some are uh, quickly exiting to the restrooms. You'll be, you'll be back with us, uh, and they can actually hear me in the restroom, which is kind of odd, but um, <laughs> so hurry them, up. So that's uh, good. At any rate, one thing I do want to mention, I know it's hot in here. 
our HVAC system went down. So tomorrow it'll be okay. Joel's going to be with us tomorrow on all three of our services. So you're welcome to join us, but it, it did go down. So just take your clothes off and relax. Uh, no, probably shouldn't do that. That's, um, any rate, uh, Joel. It's, this is the rock point of Berkeley. That's right. That's right. Um, no, it's just been great. And, and Joel, we love going to Israel, um, and uh, it's one of my favorite places to go. And love seeing you over there. Thank you. Yep. And we've taken a number of different people. By the way, just a little commercial, our next trip is the spring of 2021. And uh, Joel has agreed, if he's there, um, he'll uh, speak to our team again. So we filled up in less than 24 hours on our last trip. So I would imagine this one's going to fill up very quickly. And one of the things I love doing over there is not just going through the biblical sites, but talking about modern Israel, what is happening. And then this last trip um, with uh, Barb and Ken, some new doors opened for us as a team to begin to see what God is doing and how he's on the move in, in the Arab cultures and the Palestinian sections right. and other, t- other places over in the Middle East. And so it was great to see how God is moving with the Jewish people and the Arab individuals. And we heard from some choice individuals that are connected with the Joshua Fund. And I'll tell you, it was one of the highlights of our team because we began to pray for and see where God is doing some things over there. It's absolutely a fabulous opportunity. So I hope you can come and and join us for that. One of the questions I have, though, especially in light of what you just talked about, you moved your whole family to Israel, and now God has opened up these doors. And I think, we, you know, spiritual warfare is real. I believe that your family is, is under attack, the Joshua Fund and all of the ministries. And one of the things that I think can happen is the area of criticism. So you've been exposed to meeting with a number of these individuals that have been called tyrants, dictators, uh, murderer, obviously with the, right. the situation in Saudi Arabia. How do you protect yourself from being accused of being used or perhaps even being naive? Mm-hmm. Well, that's a good question. And right off the bat, um, I think you can't, you, you're going to be accused. You, you can't stop that, that accusation. Uh, the Apostle Paul says to, to his young uh, disciple, Timothy, all who will live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's, it, there's no way to convince everybody that you're doing some things that are right. Even, even well-meaning people will, will have totally different views uh, of what you should and shouldn't do. That's the first thing. That, that ultimately, it has to come down to Jeremiah 33.3. 3. We're calling to you, Lord, and we're asking you to show us what is great and mighty and we don't know. What is your wisdom? Do you want us to go? If you say no, we won't do it. You know, we're not looking for photo ops. We're looking to advance the kingdom, build relationships, talk about the most sensitive issues of religious freedom and lack thereof. Like in Saudi Arabia, there's not a single church that's operating in the country. In the United Arab Emirates, where we were, there are over 700 freely operating Christian churches. So uh, this was a big topic, uh, both the first time we met with the crown prince of Saudi Arabia and the second. But if you're not in the room, if you're not building a relationship, you're unlikely to be able to move the needle or at least have the, have the conversation. Um, if you're there for the photo op, you're there for the wrong reason. Uh, in fact, we didn't think any of these kingdoms wanted to do... They, they told us they didn't want any media. They wanted just a quiet talk. But something happened where they decided to go public. We didn't mind that. So I think you just have to know that you know that you know that you're doing the right thing. And you have to have a good team of wise counselors around you. It is a a unique moment. And you need a lot of wise counselors. And and even among them, not everyone's going to agree. So you have to sift it through like everything. You know, Paul thought, I should go to Bithynia. And the Lord's like, no. Oh, I should go deeper into Asia. No. I... What am I supposed to do? And then the Lord, you know, showed him what to do. And uh, so we can all have an instinct, oh, I should do this. But until the Lord opens a door, mm. we should not be trying to kick it down. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, we get a lot of blowback. Yeah. And I know if, if I, if, but it's important to build those bridges because that it opens is. the gospel. Well, the same thing is true on the Jewish side. So I was with uh, some Christians in, in an Arab country. I met with some Christian leaders, uh, you know, national leaders from those, that country. Um, and 
I w- they wanted to hear the story of the doors that were opening in the Arab world, and these are Arab Christians. And they, said, they were feeling a little discouraged. They said, you know, our, the door doesn't open for us to meet with our own leaders. I said, well, um, just to be clear, back in Israel, I have not met with the prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. I haven't met with him personally in 10 years. Yes, 19 years ago, I worked for him for a few months. Um, I continued, you know, meeting with him on doing various projects over the next year or so on and off. But I haven't had a meeting with him in 10 years. As a Jewish follower of Jesus, I'm persona non grata so far in the prime minister's office. So it it is interesting. I became, I I ended up on the front pages of the Israeli papers and television, uh, lead on the television, main television news, because I was the first Israeli ever to meet with the leadership of Saudi Arabia. But the prime minister didn't say, that's fascinating, come over and see me. So it's just one of these strange moments, and that's what the body of Christ is for. Some get doors open here, others get it over here, but we've got to work together, encourage one another, and, and not be doing it for political reasons. You're doing it because you want everybody to have a friend who knows Jesus. Mm. Because the story's bigger than us. I mean, God's in charge of this. He's a sovereign, and he's going to open up doors for individuals that he wants individuals to meet with to communicate the gospel. And that's, that's what's so affirming to hear what you've said. I mean, it just continues to reinforce that God is on the move, and God is in charge of all of this. And this is not my day job. I mean, we don't usually meet with kings and crown princes and presidents <laughs> and prime ministers. It's, you know, it's Holocaust survivors. It's refugees. Mostly, you know, it's usually people who are outside of the society, who feel powerless and mm. who don't have resources that tend to be more open to what, what can the kingdom of God, you know, what's, what is the good news of, the, of God's kingdom? Why should I follow mm. Jesus? Is he really the king? And how can he change my life? My life is a mess. Mm. When you, the higher you are with power or, 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 or resources, the less likely that you are to feel like you need the king of kings in your life. So um, it's harder for a rich man to go through the eye of a needle um, than to come into the kingdom of God. Did I get that verse right? And you know the basic verse, sorry. Um, I'll just claim life lag. It's not even jet lag. I've been in the country five weeks, so it's just life lag. I may have gotten that verse wrong. But the point is, you know what I'm saying. But it doesn't mean that rich people and kings and leaders don't come to Christ. It just means uh, it's tougher. But, they, but everybody needs to hear. Yeah, and, and one of, let, let's reverse it, because okay. one of the individuals that you aren't necessarily a fan of is uh, somebody that is uh, obviously uh, in the Oval Office. Talk, talk to us a little bit about that interaction. I think it would be good for us to hear uh, that, <laughs> sure. you know, what God did, did okay. there. Okay, well, <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, uh, let me tell it as a story, so briefly. So um, one of the things that's interesting about writing these novels is who reads them. And uh, many years ago when Mike Pence was in the House of Representatives, he and his wife were, wa- were reading my novels, and they invited me to lunch. And that's how I began a friendship with them. And that continued on to when he was governor of Indiana, invited Lynn and I out to the governor's mansion, he and Karen, um, when I was on a book tour. And we just stayed very close and, and, and prayed for them and spent a lot of time with them. And Mike Pompeo, when he was in the House of Representatives, nobody thought he was going to be the CIA director or the Secretary of State or anything. He was a reader of my novels, and he invited me to come have coffee with him, and I did. And who knew, you know, what would happen? And so that's been true of a lot of people. And then, then came the 2016 campaign. And um, so as it happens, last March, this, this last March, um, Vice President Pence invited me to come to the White House, just have lunch with him personally. Um, yes, I was going to bring him and his wife uh, copies of the new novel, The Persian Gamble. I, years ago, I used to send one, and then when he was governor of Indiana, he said, you know, it, it actually causes a little tension because it, it, <laughs> the book comes to the governor's mansion. My wife, Karen, takes it. She reads it. I can't find it. We get in a little thing. I said, listen, <laughs> you're the vice president of the United States now. Here's his and her copies, okay? I wanna, I'm pro-marriage. I'm pro-family. There you go. And uh, just, so, just so anyway, we have so. But he also wanted to hear about these delegations and and what what this so unique and what was happening. But at the end of that lunch, uh, and that was not a normal one. We've gotten together many times, as now that he's been the vice president. But he said, "Have you ever met the president?" 
<laughs> I said, no. And I said, I've never even been in the Oval Office. He said, follow me. So we walked through the West Wing, and we, he parked me in the, in the vestibule, out, out, the waiting room outside the Oval Office. He went in. A few moments later, he came out, and then he took me in. And the first person I saw actually was uh, Mike Pompeo. Uh, and uh, so I said hi to the secretary. It was fun. We've, we had just been in Egypt together, um, um, connecting with our delegation and some other things. And uh, then the next person I saw was John Bolton, who at that time was still the national security advisor. I've known John for many years uh, as a friend, but I, he doesn't read the novels that I'm aware of, but that's unconditional love. You know, <laughs> you, can, you can love people, even if you know, they're not buying and reading the novels, like, it's okay. <laughs> But the next person to walk into the room from the other side is the President of the United States. And uh, the Vice President introduces me, and um, you know, we, we have a few moments, and, he, and, and the President says, well, come, let's sit down. Let's, uh, I'd love to get to know you a little bit. And, and Pence says, well, Mr. President, I know we're meeting with the Czech Prime Minister in a few minutes for lunch, so you know, I just wanted, but Joel's not usually here. He's an evangelical, but he lives in Jerusalem. He's Israeli. And I just thought it'd be good to meet just for a moment. But I know we don't have time. No, no, we've got time. It's, so sit down. I said, okay. So, so I sit down across from the Resolute desk. And the president sits there. Pence is here, Pompeo, and Bolton. Again, back to the Sesame Street. One of these things is not like the other. <laughs> right? Now, I have written so many novel scenes in that room. And I've never been in the room. I lived in Washington for 24 years. But I was always on the other side of whoever won, you know? And so I never got in. So, um, so the president says, well, tell me a little bit about yourself. Now, I'm not on the schedule. I have no plan to meet him. And I'm thinking, ah, uh, well. But then he stops himself. And he turns to the vice president. He says, Mike, did you just say that Joel's an evangelical? And, the, and, and Penn says, yes. He said, Joel, are you an evangelical? I said, yes, Mr. President, I am. But your name, it's Joel Rosenberg. Isn't that Jewish? That's what he says. <laughs> He says, how can you be Jewish and believe in Jesus? I'm like, Lord, are you kidding me? <laughs> are you kidding me? That's my favorite question in all my life. And I'm like, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> so that's the first conversation I had with the President of the United States for the first meeting I'd ever had in the Oval Office was what does it mean to be a Jewish follower of Jesus? Then we talked about living in Jerusalem. Yes, amen. And, and you know, and, and, but then it, but he kept asking me questions, and, and I was expecting him to talk or tweet or something. <laughs> <laughs> but then he says, again, tell me a little bit. So, so keep telling me, you know, tell me another thing about yourself. So I'm like, do I, don't I, do I? Okay. Well, Mr. President, I should probably tell you that I was a never-Trumper. <laughs> until the Thursday before the election. Now, um, you know, Pastor, I, Roy. How, many well, Roy, uh, how many times do you think the term never Trumper is used in the presence of the President <laughs> of the United States? <laughs> Judging from the look of in, in his eye, not that many. <laughs> but to his credit, he, he heard me say until the Thursday before the election, and he said, well, what happened Thursday? <sighs> well... I said, okay, I'll tell you the story. So we were living in Jerusalem. We had, or we weren't in Jerusalem. We were in, um, in another town. But my wife came to me and said, we have to send in our, our absentee ballots right now by FedEx or they're not going to get there by Tuesday. So it's him or her. And I'm not trying to be political. I'm just telling, I'm relating a story that Roy asked me to tell. So I'm not just... Because you have so, dual just, citizenship. I have dual citizenship. It means I get to vote twice. It's almost like living in Chicago. You know? I'm so from that, Chicago. In that sense... I did it all the time. <laughs> so, my dad took me into the voting booth. He said, "Vote early, vote often." You don't even have to be dead. So no, it's very exciting. It's great. So, all right. So, uh, continue. So, I said, you know, she said, "It's, it's him or her." You know, I said, uh, and I'm telling you this to the president right across from him, and he and I say, so so Lynn says to me, Mr. President, Joel. Do you believe that Mrs. Clinton will keep her promises? I said, yes, that's why I'm not going down that road. She goes, do you believe that Mr. Trump will? He goes, she says, no, you don't believe that any of the conservative promises that he's made that he'll actually keep. Is that right? I said, yeah, that's right. I don't, I don't trust him. I'm saying this to him. <laughs> and, 
he's listening so far. And uh, he's got that little button, you know, underneath. He can... <laughs> so he says... Uh, so I say... She says, but Joel, you have to take it by faith. If, 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 you, if, if it's her, you know what you're going to get. If it's him, maybe, maybe something good will happen. So, so I said, Mr. President, I took that risk. Now I said... I said, I, I want to actually thank you. Um, you've done more to keep more of your promise than I expected. Now, I didn't, look, it wasn't the time, in my view, to bring up all the tweets, the overspending, the paying off a porn star. I mean, I have issues with this president. But there are, th but, I, but the Bible teaches to give honor where honor is due mm -hmm. and to honor the king. And I said, so let me tell you the things that I think you're doing right. And, you're, you know, if nothing else... You will be the most pro-life, pro-Israel president in American history. Mm. And I'm grateful for that. And the most pro-religious freedom president. So I went through probably eight or nine things that I thought he was doing well. And I said, I just, you know, I just want to encourage you to keep these promises that you've made. Mm. That was my message. And uh, at that point, he seemed to lighten, you know, brighten and, you know, and he goes, you want a picture? Let's get a picture. Bring in the photographer. Now, I, don't, I didn't think to bring the, uh, the picture tonight. But anyway, so he, I, I come around one side of the desk, and Pence comes on the other side of the desk, and it's the three of us. And you're like, come on, there's no way that a never-Trumper is standing there. <laughs> um, but look, this is, this is part of the, it's a life principle. Hmm. Like, if, if President Obama had invited me, I'd go. If I have a chance to thank him for canceling his meeting with King Abdullah, I will go. Because that's what opened the door for me to meet King Abdullah of Jordan. Um, I, you know, so I think that the key is, key, and I told him as we were waiting for the photographer, I pray for you every day, Mr. President. Hmm. And, um, and, you know, we talked about my novels. He was curious about the Persian Gamble. Uh, I told him, you know, it's basically, he, he said, what's the elevator pitch on the Persian Gamble? I said, well, imagine if the Iranian regime takes the $150 billion Dollars that, that President Obama gave them for the Iran nuclear deal. And what if Iran's regime takes that $150 billion and secretly goes to North Korea to try to buy six fully operational nuclear warheads? And uh, he goes, oh, wow. Well, that's, that's a scary premise. I said, well. He says, how do you know the Iranians aren't doing that already? I said, well, Mr. President, I'm trusting that you and the men in this room are making sure my book never comes true. You know? So the last thing we discussed among many it was... Um, we had a moment, we were waiting for the photographer to set up. I said, you know, I did write another book and I brought it for you as well. He said, oh, what's that called? I said, The Kremlin Conspiracy. <laughs> I should have seen him go. <laughs> I said, it's nothing to do with the allegations about you, Mr. President. It's about a Russian dictator uh, threatening to invade NATO and stuff. But, but I would recommend this. Can I make a recommendation? I mean, this is such chutzpah. I mean, I, he's, like, <laughs> he's like, yeah. And I'm standing next to him. And, and I, I said, well, I would recommend you take this book, The Kremlin Conspiracy. You walk out this office. We're, you know, in the Oval Office. Walk across the South Lawn to Marine One. Hold it up to the press corps and say, The Kremlin Conspiracy. It's fiction, people. It's fiction. And then get <laughs> in the helicopter. And fly off. <laughs> That's good. Anyway, we're learning how to work with all kinds of people yeah, in our lives, yeah. and I continue to pray for him and his family. I do. Mm -hmm. We are getting a ton of questions about Syria okay. and uh, what is what is taking place. Um, the pictures of of uh, you know obviously horrific things happening, other kinds of stuff. So. Uh, the question here is how do recent developments in Syria connect to potential end time events, especially as you look at uh, Ezekiel? Sure. Well, the short version of that is that um, the prophecies of Ezekiel 38 and 39 are known as the War of Gog and Magog. Uh, Gog is not a, a personal name. We're not looking for Fred Gog to emerge or Bob Gog, Dimitri Gog, Ahmed Gog. Uh, this is like a title, like a pharaoh or a czar. We're looking for a dictator to emerge in the territory of Magog. You're like, that's not helping me any. I'm like a Gog just thinking about it. Um, right, but if you do the historical detective work, and I wrote about this in a, in a nonfiction book called Epicenter that walks through the whole prophecy. So if you're interested in that, uh, I, I commend that to you, nonfiction, Epicenter. But... I explain that Magog is the ancient name for what we now call the territory of Russia and the former, some of the former Soviet republics. 
So we're looking for a dictator to emerge out of Russia. He builds an alliance with Persia. That's the first country mentioned in the list. And Persia, until 1935, was the official legal name of the country we call the Islamic Republic of Iran. But another country mentioned in that list of countries that will attack Israel in the last days of history uh, is Gomer. Now, this is not where Gomer Pyle is from, just to be clear. Uh, this is ancient Turkey. Uh, this is an ancient name for a people group in Turkey. And so you're looking for a Russian-Iranian-Turkish alliance with a few other countries, too. And, they're gonna, and after Israel is reborn as a country and Jews are back in the land rebuilding the country, that's Ezekiel 36 and 37, then at some point, 38 and 39 kick in mm -hmm. and this, this convergence. And primarily the attack comes from the north. In some sense, they're surrounded. You've got Sudan, you've got probably Algeria and other countries uh, based on the text, uh, uh, Libya. But the short version is the primary force is described multiple times as coming from the north. Well, where would they come through? They'd have to come through Lebanon and, Turkey, or, and, and, and Syria. Now, I, I, I was just teaching this uh, two weeks ago, and I said, let's be clear. We've never seen a Russian-Iranian-Turkish alliance operating militarily, jointly, just above the northern mountains of Israel in the 2,500 plus years since the prophecy was written. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean it's about to come true. I mean, 36 and 37 have largely come true. We have in Israel, we have Jews coming back into the land, our family included. Jews are coming back into the kingdom. We, we see that in the text, spiritually they're awakening. But, and so we have a lot of uh, chess players that, feel, that seem like they're forming, but it's too early to draw a conclusion. Right? God could kick the prophetic can up the road at 50, 100 years or more. So don't draw a quick conclusion, oh, this is coming true. There will be sensationalists who, who want to draw that conclusion, but we'll know if it happens. We'll know when it happens, if it happens in our lifetime. I did write a novel about how it might happen, actually five, but uh, <laughs> that's how Last Jihad starts it gets into this prophecy by the third novel called the ezekiel option so if again if that's a scenario you want to see a fictional scenario of how it might come true if it comes true in our lifetime that's a way and if you want the nonfiction walking through the prophecies epicenter might be more helpful but yeah it's an intriguing and dangerous moment and a moment that i've been quite critical of this president uh for uh, abandoning the kurds and um and giving a green light to Turkey. It's a very complicated situation. He's done many other things well, but this is something that doesn't go in that category. Mm. I think sticking with that a little bit, there's clearly a rise in anti-Semitism worldwide. Um, what are your perceptions of the reasons for this geopolitically, and what impact does this have on the receptivity of Jews to hearing the gospel? Yeah, well, uh, excellent questions. Um, let me try to give you a short version. Um, I don't know that there's a geopolitical, I mean, there are, uh, there's always, in any country, there's specific reasons, but, uh, but generally, this is, anti-Semitism is a spiritual battle. Mm. It's, sa it's satanic. It doesn't actually make any sense. Mm. Why does Satan care about the Jews? Like, if you want to pick on somebody, pick on somebody your own size. You know, we are a very small people, 17 million, but, the, but, but historically, any evil dictator is trying to wipe us out, right? Haman tries to wipe us out during the Persian Empire uh, in the Book of Esther, right? The Pharaoh, you know, is enslaving us and is happy for us to all die and sends his army after us to destroy us. And you've seen Charlton Heston and Yul Brenner, You know, you know this was not a healthy relationship. Um, <laughs> you know, you've got, you've got Stalin, you've got Hitler, you, you know, you've got bin Laden, you've got... Um, uh, al-Baghdadi, the head of ISIS, you've got a lot of people who, uh, the, the Iranian uh, Mahmoud Ahmad genocide, right, uh, you know, wipe Israel off the map, the Ayatollah Khomeini, Khamenei, you got a lot of characters, they all want to hate us, and they want to destroy us, and the word annihilate keeps coming up throughout history, comes up in the book of Esther, comes up ever since, why? The best way to understand it is John 10.10, 10. I know that doesn't seem like a verse that would immediately jump out, but here's the, there's the point. John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, the thief comes to rob, kill, and destroy, but I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. What does that mean? It means that Jesus and Satan are completely opposite beings. Now, they're not co-equal, but they are opposite, right? So, and, and so Jesus, Satan is not a create, he's not a 
creator, and he, he is a created being. And Satan can't invent things. He can only twist things. So if God says, I'm for this, Satan says, I'm against it. If God says, I want to bless something, you know, Satan says, I want to curse it. So if you, say, if you look through the scriptures, you see God saying, I'm going to choose the Jewish people and bless you. Satan says, fine, I will choose you also, and I will curse you. God says, I will give you a land. Satan says, I will take it away. God says, I will make Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, uh, uh, um, the city of peace. Satan says, fine, I'll make it the city of bloodshed. God says, I will take the temple mount and I will make it holy to my name. Satan says, fine, I will desecrate it. Israel and the Jewish people are important to Satan because they're important to God. The fact that Israel exists is evidence of God's sovereignty and his mercy. Uh, The fact that Jews have not been annihilated after very effective attempts throughout 4,000 years is an evidence of God's mercy. And and the scriptures tell us that God says, I will never let you be destroyed. I am upset with you. I will judge you if you don't listen to me and don't obey me, but I won't let the enemies destroy you. And and this is an extraordinary thing. And, um, And so we are watching, I believe as we get closer to the return of Jesus, don't know when that's going to be so don't ask that question don't text oh joel when's that going to be Ooh, i don't here know somewhere yeah yeah well we can skip that one so um but as we get closer uh and we'll talk about what are the signs that we're getting closer and how do you live that way that's tomorrow morning and i hope you'll be there for that uh, i hope i'll be there for that but yeah. anyway, you know, so but i'd be happy to be raptured tonight right that would be exciting but i don't know that. so um but as we get closer to the return of christ and as and as uh, satan is furious And he hates the fact that Jewish people are coming to Jesus. He hates that Muslims are coming to Jesus. And a lot of the geopolitical horror of the Middle East, I believe, is our physical manifestations of the spiritual battle to kill, to rob, kill, and destroy Jews and our neighbors. And that's why the church needs to be uh, humbly focused on loving Jews and Muslims Mm -hmm. and preaching the gospel because we don't know how much time we have, and this is what Jesus told us to do, and we will be, we will be held to account mm. by whether we did it, well, whether we were, we were faithful to the Great Commission and to Romans 1.16. Mm. So it sounds like you really do believe there's a difference between the church and Israel. There absolutely is a difference, and, um, you know, one of the, I, I referenced earlier that one of the problems within Christendom is that you have a wide range of views on... Um, on God's heart for or lack thereof um, for Jews and Israel. On the one hand, on the one end of the spectrum, you have supersessionism. This is the, the you know, God has superseded his, uh, or Israel has been superseded by the church. Jews rejected Jesus, therefore Jesus rejected the Jews, and all the promises made to ethnic national Israel all belong to the church, and the Jews have, are, are left with nothing. Uh, there are, I would say, like Baskin Robbins, 57 varieties, 57 flavors of supersessionism. Some aren't quite that 100% dismissive of us. They're like, oh, well, a little bit, yeah, but mostly God has done. Like, like yeah, Jews can get saved, but Israel isn't, doesn't have any promises in terms of coming back to the land. Current Israel is not, doesn't have any biblical significance. So there's a, there's a range there, and um, be careful not to lump everybody in the same category. That's one end that's a problem. Because if you don't believe that God loves Jews and has a plan for them, you're probably not going to preach the gospel to them. Or you're going to lower that on your, on your scale of everything else that you're doing. Even the, the Paul says to the church in Rome, chapter 1, uh, the church of the Gentile empire, he says to the Jew first, it's a priority. Yes, there's many people groups to reach in the world, absolutely. But there is one that's spoken of in the scriptures as this is the first priority. A chief among equals, and yet much of the church doesn't focus on Jewish evangelism, Jewish ministry. They don't give to it. They don't pray for it. They don't speak of it. They don't encourage their people to be engaged in this ministry, even though Paul says to the Jew first. So that's a problem, and if you have a faulty view of Israel, then maybe it will lead you to not thinking so being so focused on Jewish evangelism, though that's not always the case. Some people are super good on Jewish evangelism, but they don't get Israel. Okay, it's not the worst thing in the world. Israel wasn't born in 1948, reborn, because 
Is, because Jews even got it. Most Jews that founded Israel were atheists and agnostics. The religious Orthodox Jews were against the rebirth of Israel. They thought only the Messiah can rebuild it. So that's, 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 and, and, you know, that's interesting. And then the Roman Catholic Church doesn't understand Israel. Mainline Protestant liberal Christianity doesn't understand Israel. Mm. And evangelicals are divided. So, but God is not going to have his plans thwarted. He, most of the world doesn't get it. Okay, you know. So that's part of our job to teach the church. Some will get it, some won't. But I'm focused on Jewish evangelism, Muslim evangelism. That's what we should all agree on. But there's the other end, and I just have to say this. The other end of the spectrum, uh, negatively, is hyper-Christian Zionism. Now, I believe that biblical Zionism is God has a plan. Zion is a mountain in Israel, in Jerusalem, and God's bringing his people back and rebuilding the country. Most of us aren't saved yet, but he's bringing us into the kingdom. Uh, That's the short version of Zionism. Mm. But hyper-Christian Zionism is getting so excited about Israel that it become, treats Israel almost like an idol. The focus is more on Israel's political strength than the God of Israel. And so you have some, unfortunately, that love Israel and will defend her politically, and, but, but they're like, don't worry to the Jewish people. We won't tell you about Jesus. And that comes from an, I understand why some leaders say that, and some people say it, Christians, because they're saying, we know that the Jewish people have, had, have suffered so much at the hands of people who say they're followers of Jesus. We don't want to be part of that. We don't want to bother you. To, we don't want to offend you. We want to love you. We want to stand with you. We want to help you. The love, stand, support, I appreciate. That's good. But not telling us about Jesus, this is the ultimate act of anti-Semitism. Hmm. If you don't tell a person about Jesus... If you don't tell the Jewish person about Jesus and they go to hell, how have you helped them? No matter how much political support of Israel you've provided. So I don't have any problem with people providing political support for Israel if they're balanced and love Arabs too and understand Palestinians need you know, freedom and, and justice and compassion and, and they need Jesus too. So, but these two ends of the spectrum, super love for Israel or no love for Israel, both are a problem. And part of what we're trying to teach is this is what, what's biblical is something different from either of those. Mm. And that's why I'm glad to have an opportunity to come and teach here. And, and anywhere that they'll invite me, I try to, if I have time, I try to, mm-hmm. try to say yes. That's Excellent. a long answer, but that was a doctoral dissertation question. So, <laughs> Yeah, well, it was here. So, <laughs> you know, far be it for me to correct your metaphors. I don't know how many flavors of ice cream Baskin Robin has. I love ice cream, but it's Heinz 57 oh, I see. varieties. Okay. Yeah. What is the number in Baskin Robbins? I, I have think no it's, idea. There's 50 something. 49, 51, I don't know. I'd like some ice 31, cream maybe. right now. Okay, maybe you're right about Heinz. Yeah, I think so. But That's they, the Pittsburgh we'll go side of our, my wife's family. It must be <laughs> seeping in. Thank you. you know, since you're talking about evangelism, though, how would you share Christ with a Jew versus somebody who is Muslim? What's the difference? Oh. And how oh. would you... That's How huge. much time did you say we had? Yeah, <laughs> but it's a good one, and yeah. it was here. There's a bunch of great questions. Uh, the questions are phenomenal. I can't get to all of them, but this is a big one. And since you were talking about that, why don't you unpack that one just a little bit? We're going to run just a few minutes over, um, so I hope you're okay with that. All right? Most of them are asleep anyway. It's all good. It's just... okay comfortable chairs it's a lovely evening it's a little warm they're all like "Mm, it's all good um well um okay uh to the jew first yeah several things first i would say just give him one of my novels right (laughs) the the gospel is woven into these books not not every character gets saved and not you know in every book but 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 it'll take you on a spiritual journey one of the reasons i've written them is so that i can share the gospel with all kinds of people who will read the books but also because you give that book to somebody who you either have shared with them every way you know how and they're not listening, and they're not getting it, try this. Or you're really terrified of sharing the gospel, but you know you should. So give the, you know, give the Persian gamble or whatever to your Jewish dentist, doctor, chiropractor, head of a major motion picture studio, your CPA, whatever, and to anybody. I mean, that's, it's a great way of sort of getting them into it and, and it um, eases them into the pool. So that, that's, that's one way. Another way is um, posting on your Facebook page um, video testimonies. I have my, I've got my own. Um, it's online. You can just Google uh, Joel Rosenberg and testimony. And I did, I've done several versions, but the video version is with a ministry called One for Israel. 
And that's one of the ministries that we support in Israel. They have done Hebrew language Jewish testimonies of how they've come to faith. That's been seen by more than, that's been more, had more than 15 million views, those mm-hmm. Hebrew language testimonies. Mm-hmm. And the English language ones have had more than 80 million views. And, and I did one, it runs about nine minutes, and it starts with, dude. <laughs> And that's how I hook you into that story of how I came, you know. So those are ways. You, just a simple click, you share that, and now people who are looking at your Facebook page. But getting to your specific point, the way Paul did it was to focus Jewish people on the prophecies. You know, pro- Messianic prophecy is interesting because I describe it like a phone number, okay? If you were to, to call me and you started dialing 1703, I'm not going to give you my whole number, but... If, you know, if I gave you, the, you know, if you knew my number and you started dialing 1703, uh, eventually when you get to the last number, you, you would find me. Why is that? In the world of more than 7 billion people, how does, how does your dialing the phone with 10 digits, how do you get me? Well, you won't get me. You'll get my voicemail because I'm usually using my Israeli phone, but that's not the point. The point is, how does that work? Every number you put into the phone, the computers are eliminating options. So when you do 1703, you've eliminated the entire world, all of America, all of Virginia, except for Northern Virginia, because that's where we bought the phone, right? So, so now the computer already knows four digits in, we're only focusing on Northern Virginia. And every number that goes by, eliminating, 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 until it gets to this phone. That's extraordinary with only 10 numbers. That's what Messianic prophecy does. The Messianic prophecies say, that the Messiah is not going to come from the sky the first time. Uh, he comes as a baby, right? Isaiah 9 says, for unto us a child is born. Uh, okay, so we're looking for a baby. That's, that's the first thing we're looking for. And whatever the story of this Messiah coming is going to have a pretty interesting birth story. Now, we're looking for a, a male baby. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, right? So you now eliminate half the world's population who are women, okay? We love women, but they're not, you're not the Messiah. Okay, so we have one. Now, in Micah, the, the Hebrew prophet tells us the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. Now, I had to say at Bethlehem College and Seminary last week, that's not here. You're, you know, you, you, that's, there's a very specific Bethlehem. It's not Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. It's not, not Bethlehem Baptist Church. It's Bethlehem Ephrata in Judea. There was even a Bethlehem in northern Israel. Right, but in ancient times, but it's a very specific one. It's the little town of Bethlehem, just outside of Jerusalem, where David was born. That's where you know where Jesse is from. That's that's the town. Has he? So you're now eliminating the entire planet of where this baby can be born. It's a baby. It's a male baby. Has to come from this little town of Bethlehem. He has to be Jewish. That becomes clear. He has to be from the line of David. And just one more for the sake of discussion, Daniel. In Daniel chapter 9, says the Messiah will be cut off. Rabbis didn't know what that meant, but something bad is going to happen to the Messiah. Okay, that's interesting. And then it says, and this will all happen before the temple is destroyed and Jerusalem is destroyed. Well, now we know that was 70 AD. So now we're looking for a human baby, a male, born in Bethlehem, Ephrata of Judea, Jewish, of the line of David, who something bad happens before 70 AD. Now, can we think of anyone? Anyone, we're just spitballing. Just throw a name out there. Just any Jewish person that comes from that town, anybody that comes to mind. Let's just open it up. It's free discussion. We're happy to, who are our options? Who is the most famous person from Bethlehem? Arguably cut off, something bad happened. It happened before 70 AD. Just, just anybody, just, just free association. Right? That is, that's how we know. That's how Jews know this is Jesus. But most Jews don't know those prophecies. So even before you open up a New Testament, it's good just to spend time taking them to those prophecies. Hmm. Now, ideally, if you can take them through the book of Luke or, or Matthew or Mark or, or John, like my father went through Luke, he just, that's how it starts to come alive. Because what does Paul say? Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of Christ, by the word of the Messiah. So you want to not argue um, whatever is the best persuasive thing that you want to say. That's not as effective as getting them into the scriptures. And and any chance you get to say, you know, look up on your phone, Isaiah chapter 53. Let's just go through that together. That's the Hebrew prophet Isaiah. We're not even talking about the New Testament. 
All right, they can just take that and Google it. Look at Micah chapter 5. Let's just pull that up for a moment. Anything you can do to get them reading or you read it to them, the, hearing the word of God, this is how it works. Um, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. Uh, and it's interesting if you look at, uh, I'll be teaching next month, one of the Joshua Fund projects that we do is we, we have, uh, it's amazing, this will be the eighth year that we do the only national conference in Israel of all the pastors and ministry leaders and their wives that are, that are able to come, more than 300 come, to a, a, a pastor's and wives conference that Joshua Fund funds 100%. We take them through the word of God every year. And right now we're going through Acts. We also do this for the Palestinian. All the Palestinian pastors and their wives and all the ministry leaders in the West Bank and Gaza, it's about 95% of all that there are are able to come and want to come. We've been doing this for eight years now as of next month. And I'll be teaching from Acts 17 where Paul goes into Thessalonica and he goes into a synagogue. And what does it say? He says he reasons with them from the scriptures from the prophecies. And why did the Messiah have to suffer and die? And he, he's, he's, he's walking them through. But, when, but I also, I think I teach that in, I forget, I teach that to the Israeli side or the Palestinian side. We do the conferences back to back. But the other side, whichever city I do the other one, I do the next portion of Acts 17. That's when he's in Athens. Speaking to the Greek pagans is a totally different way of sharing the gospel than with Jews because the word of God and the prophecies isn't the basis of discussion. So that's about, I think, as detailed as I can get. Um, I would just add one other thing. Some of you may have heard or read about in my books, God is revealing himself uh, through dreams and visions, uh, the the person of Jesus, to many, many Muslims. Jews too, but many Muslims. Um, And I believe this is true. I've interviewed from Afghanistan to Morocco uh, Dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of, of these stories and, and, and really spent time with people. I believe these are true. I believe Satan can use dreams and visions to deceive. Uh, we see that in Galatians chapter 1. We see it in Deuteronomy 13. We see it in the book of Revelation. There are, we, fall, uh, we see it in, in Matthew 24. False teachers, false messiahs, false... But, but I do believe Jesus is revealing himself. But that's not a strategy for the church. Paul, who came to faith through a vision, right? Stephen did preach the gospel to him, but he hated him for it, and he killed him, or was part of that. But So we preach, we, we, we plant the seeds, but, but God can supernaturally quicken those seeds through a vision. That's what happened on the road to Damascus. But Paul, who has seven recorded visions that we have in the Bible, never tells us that's the strategy to reach somebody. Right. You know... The book of Joel, admittedly my favorite book, um, (laughs) Joel says in the last days, young people will see and old people will see dreams and visions. God will use that. Yes, that's true, but it's not a church strategy. Our job is to preach the gospel to every person, every place, and give them an opportunity to hear, understand, and make a decision for Jesus or against him. Receive or reject. That's our job. How God quickens those seeds of the gospel to believe that's his business, and he can use dreams and visions and other supernatural ways. It's all supernatural, but th- that's pretty dramatic. Um, and I've met people who are, that's how they got saved. But the church has to focus on what we're told. And the Paul who had the vision, that's how he got saved. He's the one who writes, how shall they believe unless they've heard? And how shall they hear unless someone goes tells them? And how will somebody tell them unless they're sent? Mm. This is the heart of the Joshua Fund. And whether it's a Jew or a Muslim, isn't so much of it built on a relationship with the intent of sharing the gospel, keeping that in, in, in mind, but that bridge is, is built Absolutely. on a relationship. So if it's somebody here, you know, a Jewish individual or someone you've reached out to, so much of it is just being willing to be engaged with them Absolutely. at a relational level. Isn't Absolutely, it? and that, that's, that's about love, and that's about friendship, and that's about kindness. I believe that the reason that many more Jews almost 900,000 have come to faith in Jesus in, in America is because they've met many Christians who've loved them, who've invited them to church, who've, who've, who've prayed for them, who've shown kindness to their children, who, you know, not to deceive or lure them, just to love them they would, the way they would love anybody. And because when Jews have the opportunity to meet people who love Jesus, they're more inclined to, um, to consider the claims of Christ, because they're beginning to think, well, maybe this isn't a book of, you know, a, a handbook on anti-Semitism. Maybe mm. there is life 
in these pages. Maybe I ought to read them, and that's a great thing. But that's also true of Muslims. Muslims have a lot of preconceptions. But Muslims believe from the Quran that Jesus was born of a virgin with a miraculous birth, that he is the Messiah, that he did miracles, that he taught, uh, that he was a wise teacher. He's more, Jesus is more revered in Islam than any other prophet. That's what the text says. And the Quran tells Muslims to read the Injil, which means the New Testament. Hmm. Now, since the seventh century when that was written, Many Muslim scholars said, oh, the, the, the New Testament and the Bible has been corrupted, has been changed. But that's not what Muhammad said. Muhammad told Muslims to read the New Testament. So you'd have to ask, well, what New Testament did he mean? Something written before the 7th century, right? So let's go get some copies of 7th century and let's compare them to today. Oh, look, they haven't been changed. We have Dead Sea Scrolls. We know what the text says. It's not different. That's the, one of the blessings of archaeology dig, digging up out of the ground. More and more of these scrolls, we can go, oh, wow, look at this. So if you can get a Muslim to read the Bible, begin that process, that, that's wonderful. It's going to take some time. It's going to take a lot of prayer. And one of the things we say in the Joshua, and if you, you know, in a way to distill all that we've been discussing, uh, I, I say there's four things you should walk away with. I'm sorry, I'm not... Talking directly to you guys, I feel like I need a swivel. Um, uh, next time, we'll do a swivel. Yeah, we'll do it next yeah. time. Uh, four things to remember as you, as you sort of walk away from here. Learn, pray, give, and go. So that's what we say. Uh, you want to learn what is God's heart for Israel and the neighbors. What does the Bible say from Genesis to Revelation? What, what is God's heart about this? And we've got lots of videos of me teaching on this. Obviously, I've written books on it and, uh, and so forth. And we've got newsletters and lots of w ways to educate. And, of course, go with your pastor to Israel. This is a way. This is a great way. And maybe, you know, uh, I, I don't know if you guys have sign-ups yet. Not yet, but we will shortly. Okay, so yeah. I would encourage you to, to do that. That's a way to learn. The more you learn about God's heart and what God is doing, and you're here tonight learning, so amen, the more you're likely to say, okay, I should. I should start praying for Prime Minister Netanyahu, President LCC, you know, all these leaders, and I should pray for uh, the churches that are struggling, but they're doing the work of the gospel. I should pray for the Joshua team as they... they uh, invest and, and encourage and serve and teach the pastors and ministry leaders and the people of the region. So learning, the more you learn, hopefully you'll pray more and more effectively, more focused. Then giving, give uh, financially to ministries, uh, Joshua Fund included, that, that, that are a trusted resource. That's a big challenge because again, how do you know how your $25 or 25,000 or 250,000, how do you know if that is gonna have an impact? And we are happy. We've got team here. We've got a table out there. Happy to talk to you. Follow up with an email, a phone call. Uh, our staff is ready to talk to you about what we do and why we do it. But learning, praying, giving, and then going. And that comes back to going to Israel if you can. Yes, some of the Arab countries, it's challenging. I'm not encouraging you to go all in. But, but the other thing is go out to your neighbors and start talking about these things. And your small group Bible study saying, maybe we should start making praying for the peace of Jerusalem and the spread of the gospel a thing. Maybe as a small group, we should go with Pastor Roy and Lynette to go to Israel. Like, let's not just do it as a couple. Let's do it as a little team. Because when we come back, we can talk about, well, what, would, what does that mean for us? Mm -hmm. Look, I'm telling you, I, again, from the venture capital perspective, for 2,000 years, the investment in Jewish evangelism had very low fruit. Like, you know, it wasn't a lot of fruits. You know, it was, we had very little impact. I joke that if you had a company called Jew.com, Jewish Evangelism Works, that's the Jew part, .com, and if you, and you were investing in that company, the stock price was pretty low for 2,000 years because there was almost no impact. Right? Now, if you were going to the CNBC stock charts and you zoomed in, you'd see, you know, you'd see some flickers in the first century, and then it just seemed to flatline near zero. But what we're seeing, in the, as I've been describing, what we've been seeing in the last 40 years, 50 years, 52 years since I've been born, and certainly in the last 10 or 15, we are seeing spikes. So if you went to that CNBC stock chart and you narrowed it down, and you said, let me just see the 10-year chart, the five-year chart, you're seeing spikes, both of response 
and of interest, willingness to hear that yeah. all these videos that we invest in, that, that people are watching and are considering the gospel. That's extraordinary. So since we are supposed to focus on Jewish evangelism to the Jew first and to the Gentiles, a ministry that does both at a season where Jews and Muslims are listening more than ever, this is an exciting time. We, you know, we are, I don't know if maybe I'm, I know I'm not sounding so Scandinavian. I'm a little excited. I'm Jewish. I'm very passionate. I can't, I can't talk if I don't have my hands. <laughs> so I, I get excited. And I am excited about this moment. And I, you know, we can't, we're, yes, we're a venture capital fund or, or mutual fund. But just to be clear, you know, with all the caveats that come with a fund, right, we're not, we can't provide you a return in this life, right? And if you want higher returns, like you want to see the maximum amount of fruits, Either invest here um, or China, Brazil, sub-Saharan Africa, right? In the grand scheme, God is moving to bring more people into the kingdom in those areas than in Israel and the Muslim world. But this, to me, is the most exciting because it's the final frontier of the gospel. Mm-hmm. Not to quote Star Trek, but, but it's, it's, it's exciting. And to me, it's difficult, um, but it's rewarding. And, and there will be rewards in heaven. And what they are, I don't know, but... The main thing is you don't want to stand before Jesus and have him go, so mm. did you invest your talents wisely? Mm. Oh, no, Jesus, I, I knew you were a hard man, and I just wanted to hide what you'd give me financially, my time, my talent, my treasure. I didn't really believe you were going to, you know, so I just didn't, I just, you know, well, didn't you might at least put my money in a bank and get some interest? Um, no, Lord, I just didn't really want to take any risk. That is not the way Jesus commends the people in that, in effect, mm. That, that's not commended. It's just the opposite. But mm-hmm. what is commended is, is, is investing for, for kingdom purposes. Mm-hmm. And um, so we're trying to invest our time, our talent, our treasure, and be a, a way for others to do it too because if it was easy to reach Israel with the gospel, it would be done by now. And so what it needs is a, a, a global movement of prayer and it needs resources financially and otherwise and it needs people who are not getting ahead of Jesus, that we, we, we humble ourselves and say, Lord, we're not coming in with a set of tool, a toolbox that we know all this is going to work because it worked someplace else. Mm-hmm. No, no, Lord, show us how to serve the local church uh, in an effective way. And some of the way, I would argue, is knowing when not to invest, right? We're not just vetting to say, oh, that's a, a ministry that's not really, they're, you know, they're heretics or they're, you know, prosperity gospel or they're whatever, so we shouldn't invest in that. It's not just that. It's also to say, Lord, let's say, so maybe I, can I close, or how, can I close yeah, up with keep this? Going. Or, I'll, I'll wrap it up. Just all right, all right. Yep. But here's an example I use often. Um, imagine if the Apostle Peter called me and said, Joel, you will not believe where I am. I'm on the north shore of Galilee. And Jesus, I don't know, can you hear that? Jesus is preaching. And we've got like 5,000 men and untold numbers of women and children. And he's been teaching all day. And it's so exciting. I said, wow, Peter, thank you for calling. It's so exciting. I, that's awesome, dude. Dude. And uh, he said, yeah, it is awesome. But the thing is, Jesus just said to us that we have to feed all these people. And to be honest, we do not have the money to feed all these people. I don't know what he's thinking. But then I thought, but then, but then one of the guys on the team uh, said, or my brother Andrew, maybe, he says, call Joel. He runs the Joshua Fund. They can wire like $50,000 right away, and, they, and you, we can buy the food, and we can feed these people. So that's why I'm calling. Would you, would you wire the money? I'm like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Jesus is teaching. You guys are there. You need m- money for food to help this ministry. Done. Done. I'm going to call. I'm going to Call T- Tim Lugbill, the executive director of the Josh Fund. We will have money there by, you know, very soon. We'll wire it. Very exciting. And I, and, I'm, and I, let's say that happened backstage. I was like, Roy, it's just so exciting to be involved in this work. And then, bling, oh, sorry, just one second. Jesus, oh my gosh, I, I should take this call. Jesus, wow. <laughs> yes, wow. It's so good to hear from you. Yeah, wow. Yes, I heard that you were teaching up a storm up there in Galilee. That's so exciting. But, oh, I'm sorry, what? Yes, yes, we did. We wired the money just a few moments ago. We're so excited to get involved and invest. You, you, what? You, you, didn't, you didn't want us to do that. Oh, well, I, well, Peter said, but, well, no, that's true. He often, he often says stuff, but, I, I, but, <laughs> but he indicated that, well, no, right. He's not always 
he's not always right. No, I, 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 yeah, no, I have read that section, yeah. I, we, but we were thinking that, well, no, no, I didn't, I didn't call you because I thought that, well, no, I, well, you're, you're right, I, I should have called you. I, no, I should have asked you right before I, oh, you were, you were going to try to do a miracle there, huh? You, you, you didn't want any money. You, you were just going to use that little boy's loaves and fishes. Oh, I'm, so I sort of blew your miracle. Okay, I'm, you know, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I, I, I am. I'm very, very sorry, and, I, and we won't do it again. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. All right, love you. Bye. <laughs> the ministry can be great. Mm. The need is real. Mm. And Jesus says, stay out of my way. Mm. And having the discernment to know the difference, mm. not just a her- heretical ministry that you shouldn't invest in, but an absolute awesome ministry that Lord's like, I'm not, I don't want you to be involved. I'm giving that a blessing to someone else or whatever. I'm doing something. Mm. I want them to live on lo- loaves and fishes. Having the discernment, that's why we have to build a team that understands the work of Jesus and, and we're all listening. And we have a team that, that challenges one another and says, are we hearing carefully? And I, mm. it's just a very challenging thing because there's a lot of static <laughs> mm. um, and, and the enemy wants us to mess up the plans of Jesus. We won't ultimately, but we can make mistakes and we're... Uh, we're a work in progress ourselves. Yeah. Well, we love what you're doing, and uh, it's been uh, just an incredible evening. Thank you for staying a little bit longer yeah, so that much. we could have a part of this. I promise just about two minutes here. I'm going to ask the chairman of the Joshua Fund to come up, Wayne Peterson. Um, you probably are familiar with uh, his name. He was with KTIS for a number of different years, for a number of years, and he's going to share just briefly about the Joshua Fund. There's a table in the back, and then I'll pray and, and let you go. Joel's going to be back with us tomorrow morning as well. Thank you, Roy. I don't know how you top this. Wow, uh, Joel, you've told the story so well. Thank you, Joel. Uh, can you imagine uh, being on the board of a ministry like this? We just came from a board retreat and heard the marvelous things that God is doing on the ground in Israel and her neighbors. It's, uh, I've been involved in a lot of great ministries, but this is so exciting to see what God is doing in the epicenter. I've had the privilege of going on some of these uh, delegations with uh, Joel and his team to see how God is poking holes in the wall of uh, places that were Uh, utterly closed until just the last few months, the last couple of years. It's pretty amazing. Uh, Willie Willie and I joined this board because, well, number one, it's for Israel and her neighbors. It's not either or, it's both. Uh, We joined the board because they not only evangelize and disciple, they do humanitarian work, feeding 2,500 families a month, providing diapers and clothes to moms that decide to to go through the pregnancy and give birth to a child, helping refugees that are streaming in from other parts of the world, uh, equipping pastors, both uh, Palestinian pastors and Messianic pastors that in the past haven't talked to each other and gathering them for two weeks and they pray together and worship together and learn how to teach God's word. And it's an exciting, exciting time working with the Bible Society there and uh, translating and distributing scriptures in Hebrew, Russian, and Arabic to the world. Um, It could go on and on, the great things that are happening in that part of the world. The young people, helping young people find Jesus, young people in the military and the universities that are being evangelized and discipled to following Jesus and to see the great openness and growth in that part of the world. So um, it's a great treat. Thank you for your passion for Israel and her neighbors, for the work of God in these amazing days. And there is a table as you leave tonight, and there's a wonderful one-page brochure there and something more in depth. And number one, we would ask you to pray because we're in enemy territory and there is spiritual spiritual warfare because we are invading enemy territory. So pray for Joel and his family and his team that are on the ground there. Then also become informed. Go to our website at Joshua Fund, the Joshua Fund website, and you can find out more great videos there that explain the ministry. Uh, and you can also give. 
Um, there, there are financial needs. We're seeking to make the best possible use of finances of our relatively small ministry, but is having huge leverage impact. So we invite your prayers and your engagement and your giving as well. And so thank you very, very much for being here tonight. The partnership with this wonderful church is just so encouragement to all of us. So thank you. Pastor Roy, and thanks to your team here and the Rock Point family for all you do. God bless you. Subscribe to our videos by clicking the subscribe button. You'll find some videos that we've chosen specifically for you. And if this is a ministry that you'd like to support financially, just make a tax deductible donation by clicking here to visit our giving page. Thank you. We look forward to partnering with you to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus.